1993, Tsuburaya Productions would introduce an economically unstable, technology-driven Japan to a hero for the current times. A hero who would go on to spawn a multimedia franchise two decades later in the era of social media. This is the story of how a once quite popular but eventually somewhat forgotten tokusatsu series became so much more. A series that went from a fun romp created by a passionate film crew with a great goal at heart to something truly special over two decades later. I'm talking about the hyper agent, Gridman. Gridman follows the exploits of an interdimensional fighter, Gridman, a being from a realm of existence called the Hyperworld, who sent out to take down terrorists and criminals who escaped from the Hyperworld to wreak havoc in other realities. Through the modern electronics created by humanity, Gridman can come into contact with humans who he sees as having a pure heart, and combine with them to take a physical form, to battle these villains in the massive, destructive kaiju that they manipulate emotionally vulnerable people into creating. While the series was never envisioned as a multimedia property, the original 1993 tokusatsu series would have a fascinating production and impact on Japanese children's television, becoming one of the first shows to truly usher in the era of digital VFX, that over 20 years later would transform into something truly special, reaching its full potential. Even as early as this original show, the groundwork was set for the mentality that would define the series. Themes of social isolation, the spark to create within all of us, our relationship with the ever-advancing technology around us, and the importance of human connection, all wrapped up in an exceptionally over-the-top, at times very cheesy and childish vibrato. The original show is genuinely a ton of fun, and serves as a really fantastic time capsule of early 90s Japan. Despite there being a massive gap in series activity between 1994 and 2015, the themes and concepts established in this initial live-action show would be expanded upon beautifully in the phenomenal anime sequel trilogy from Studio Trigger, with an excellent 2018 sequel in the form of SSSS Gridman, ushering in a new explosion of Gridman side stories and extra media, that series eventually getting its own sequel in the 2021 anime, SSSS Dinazenon, a series that is quite possibly my favorite anime of the last decade. The franchise is now a serious success in Japan, climbing right back up to the original 93 tokusatsu series in overall popularity, with a rabid, very vocal fanbase having formed in Japan. And its latest 2023 entry, an excellent cinematic finale to the Studio Trigger trilogy, Gridman Universe, surpassing expectations and performance at Japanese theaters, bringing in over the equivalent of 6 million USD so far, which may not sound like much on paper, but these numbers are quite solid for a limited release anime film screened in under 160 theaters, and it's been considered a great success for both Tsuburaya and Studio Trigger, in terms of critical and audience reception, which has been overwhelmingly positive. I saw the movie twice while I was in Japan this past April, and at the end of this video, I'll cover certain aspects of it without getting into major spoilers. But for now, let me just say yes, it's pretty fantastic and a fitting cap-off to this trilogy, both thematically and in scale. But how exactly did the Gridman series get here? It's been a long road since the birth of the hero, and this is a complete retrospective on every corner of the series. In celebration of the original series' 30th anniversary, this is the story of the Hero of Dreams. The context behind the original series' development is quite interesting. The tokusatsu classic was the work of Tsuburaya Productions, named after its creator and one of the fathers of Godzilla, Eiji Tsuburaya. The studio would be the home with the massively influential monolith of Japanese media and special effects, Ultraman, a series that's name is etched into the halls of live-action Japanese special effects television royalty, right next to Kamen Rider and Super Sentai. Despite having less of a foothold outside of Asian territories, Ultraman is easily the most influential of the three tokusatsu kings, ushering in a new era of sci-fi storytelling throughout Asia in general, each entry following the journey of its respective extraterrestrial Ultra and the human body that they occupy. Exploring themes of identity, heroism, and the human condition in forms digestible to all ages. The series would serve as a groundwork for serialized science fiction in Japan for decades to come, and its impact on a significant amount of Japanese media that you probably love yourself cannot be overstated. Ultra is an institution, and the franchise is so vast that covering it in a traditional video retrospective would take hours upon hours. But there was a period of time where the literal giant of a series, and Super Eye Productions itself, would be put in a tough spot. In 1980, the ninth and at the time final television Ultraman series, Ultraman 80, would air. 80 coming right off the back of Tsuburaya's successful collaboration with legendary anime studio Sunrise in their animated series, The Ultraman, or as it's commonly referred to as, Ultraman Jonius. While Jonius performed quite well, Ultraman 80 struggled. This was mainly due to the late 70s being a rough period for tokusatsu in general, due to the restrictions on budget and funding brought on by the global oil crisis of the 70s. 
Advertising opportunities were beginning to dry up, and sponsors were pulling out. It also didn't help that the first chunk of Ultraman 80 took place around a school, a setting which wasn't particularly popular with general audiences at the time. Ultraman 80 would underperform in both television ratings and toy sales, causing Superiot to hemorrhage money. Unable to recoup the costs of the expensive large-scale production of the show, the time simply didn't leave room for successful Ultra series like the 60s and pre-Oil Crisis 70s. This put the Ultra franchise on a fairly lengthy hiatus. The next decade was a shaky one for Super Eye Productions, to put it lightly, with only one TV production releasing in the 80s after the failure of Ultraman 80, the short, five-minute episode miniseries, and Ultraman spin-off, Andromelos. Melos was filmed and produced on an extremely cheap scale when compared to the other entries in the Ultra series, being far more reminiscent of Super Eye Productions' earlier non-Ultra work, such as Red Man. The series served as more of a way for Super Eye Productions to keep the lights on in the studio, and keep at least some Ultra media visible to the public as they cruised on licensed deals and existing Ultra merchandise for a majority of the 80s. Super Eye was somewhat floundering, and general audience interest was shifting more towards anime, as well as Toei taking Super Eye a spot when it came to relevant and popular live-action TV shows. Seeing the local Japanese market as a bit of a lost cause at the time, and a very difficult uphill battle, 1987 would see Super Eye Productions attempt to penetrate the international market. The first step in this plan was a collaboration with Hanna-Barbera on an animated four-episode pilot for an American version of Ultraman. It was titled Ultraman The Adventure Begins. The project was a valiant effort, but it garnered little interest from American and European television networks meaning that this initial movie-length collection of episodes was all that was ever produced. As the Showa era concluded in 1989 and the Heisei era began, Tsuburaya wanted to use the start of this fresh new era in Japan's history to reboot their legacy franchise after a decade off the airwaves. But with the Japanese economy in shambles thanks to the financial crash brought on by the bubble economy collapsing, Tsuburaya Productions had to be extra careful with its already tight funds. The studio ended up moving its production to Australia, working with the South Australian Film Corporation in an attempt to save money, and thus, Ultraman Towards the Future, or Ultraman Great as it was called in Japan, was born. While the show still suffered from budget constraints, and even underperformed in its original airing in Australia, 1992 would see the Aussie-Japanese co-production air on Fox TV, whose acquisition of the broadcasting rights would then see it air across the USA, South America, Europe, South Asia, and Hong Kong. And while the show certainly wasn't a major success, the broad international net Fox helped it cast would finally put some much-needed funding back in Super Eye's pockets. Though the show wouldn't air on Japanese TV until some years later, the international experiment worked out for the most part in spite of its tight budget. With some cash flow back in the studio's grasp come mid-1992, the at-the-time head of the sales department, and grandson of Eiji Tsuburaya himself, Kazuo Tsuburaya, wanted to bring production back to the studio's homeland of Japan. The ambitious, hungry young member of the Tsuburaya family wanted to create a new series that could specifically speak to the children of an economically unstable Japan, a Japan that at the time was struggling to adjust to its new era. He thought that a series that inspired hope in these children would be the perfect fit for the current turbulent times. Tsuburaya Productions was also fast approaching its 30th anniversary, driving Kazuo's desire even further to create a show to celebrate that milestone, a show that could ignite the spark within children that the Ultra series had done for the previous generation in the 60s and early 70s. Kazuo Tsuburaya would step up himself to become the producer for this new project, gathering every single employee of the studio back home in Japan, with the idea of putting all hands on deck to finally create a full-length television series domestically for the first time since Ultraman 80, which had been 12 years ago at that point. Not being a creative himself though, Kazuo needed concept writers to take the mantle and fill out this new project into a true, complete pitch. Writers Naoyuki Eto, one of the key writers behind the Ultraman Jonius anime, and Yasushi Hirano, a longtime anime scriptwriter who had previously also written on Ultraman Jonius, as well as contributed to Ultraman 80, would be the key minds brought in to bring this 30th anniversary pitch to life. The two initially came up with a working series concept called Big Man. Eto and Hirano created a draft that centered around three elementary school children, Naoto, Yuka, and Ipe, as a digital superhero by the name of Big Man comes into contact with them, through a home computer belonging to Naoto. The hero would take the form of a CGI render that Naoto had been working on. Big Man would then tell the children that he had come from a realm called the Computer World to rescue its princess, who had been kidnapped by a cyber criminal named Shredder. Artist Kazumitsu Akumatsu, a toy and concept designer working at Takara at the time on Transformers toys, had been drafting a cancelled toy line for a spin-off of the 1988 tokusatsu, Denoke Cyber Cop, titled Cyberman. Takara already had a close relationship with Super Eye Productions, and would strike a deal with them to produce the inevitable toy line for Big Man. Because of this, Akamatsu would be asked by Takara to help Super Eye in designing the look for their new series Big Man, to which he would take his scrapped Cyberman design and rework it as Big Man. 
Akamatsu would also be asked to design a series of support weapons for Big Man to use in combat, and to transform into new forms. For all of the mecha fans watching, there's a chance that you might recognize Kazumitsu Akamatsu's name, as the original concept designer who worked with Masami Obari to create the Gravion series a decade later. Eto and Hirano would then rework some of the less surefire aspects of the initial draft, scrapping the Princess and Shredder entirely, and replacing them with the loner student and computer whiz, Takashi, and the evil being who would manipulate him into creating Kaiju. Con Digifer. The setting was also bumped up a few years from elementary school to middle school, with the computer world being renamed the Hyperworld, and Big Man's name being changed to Gridman. With some adjustments and finalized edits Akamatsu brought to the designs, and with the pitch document complete, Eto and Hirano would set out to write a series that would capture and reignite the imagination and hope of Japanese children watching the show at home. Quoting their original pitch document that finally saw Gridman greenlit, The world is entering an era of collapse, starting with the bursting of the bubble economy. However, it is also the arrival of an age in which we will make a new era in future. It is the dawn of an era in which we will create our own dreams and future with our own hands. What will be required in the coming age is a mindset of having a big dream and making something little by little towards achieving it. Achieving that dream may be difficult by the power of one person. However, if those who share the same dream join forces and face it together, they will surely be able to make that dream come true. 1993 is the year of creation of making dreams, the year of the first step in the coming age of creation. And the Lightning Superman Gridman, who will be created in 1993, is a superhero who will symbolize and foreshadow this age of creation. Making one's own dream is the starting point of Gridman. With the series now moving into pre-production, and Tsuburaya's staff preparing to finally create their first full TV series in over 12 years, and a massive 30th anniversary celebration, late 1992 would see the show's special effects director and showrunner chosen. These duties would fall into the hands of Eiji Tsuburaya understudy, longtime employee, and legendary effects director, Kazuo Sagawa who had worked on the effects and cinematography of every Tsuburaya production since the original Ultra Q in 1966. This would only be his third time seeing over every single episode of a show's production, though, and it would be his most daunting task yet. The show would be using the at-the-time new digital tape format, D2, being the first Tsuburaya series shot on this form of video. It was an entirely new field for the studio, as all of their previous work had been shot on film. Sagawa's mindset with the use of this new format was, in his own words, stated in the Gridman Complete Works book from 1994, With digital tape, no matter how many times it is copied, the picture quality does not deteriorate. To put it another way, even after 100 times, it'll look the same. If you've ever watched sports programs in slow motion, you know that the normal slow motion would have resulted in choppy motion. However, as a result of our testing, we found that if we post-process the time between frames properly, the motion became smooth. For the shot where the building collapsed before your eyes, we shot the scene with 6 to 10 times slowness. And I don't think there's ever been a visual that could produce that kind of sensation with video. So the advantages of digital tape helped us a lot. Also, there are now very small cameras available. It's called a light pin camera, and it can get into any narrow space. The scene I just described of the destruction of the building was made possible in large part by the camera. D2 video also allowed for at the time cutting edge digital effects and CGI to be integrated directly into recordings through state of the art editing software, meaning an entirely new level of VFX was possible for a TV production like Gridman. And with the series digital themes and concept, these new techniques seemed like a perfect fit. With everything set, costumes were produced and a cast was hired. Filming of Denko Chojin Gridman would begin on January 18th, 1993 with the first episode airing three months later on the major TV channel TBS on April 3rd, 1993. Three tech-obsessed middle schoolers, Naoto Sho, Yuke Inoue, and Ibe Baba, are building a computer out of scrounged together parts that they've nicknamed Junk, to use in an attempt to render a CG image of a superhero, when suddenly, the computer is possessed by an entity named Gridman. A being from the Hyperworld who's taken the form of the hero this trio created, Gridman has come to track down the evil overlord, Khan Digifer, a wanted criminal from the Hyperworld who escaped into the computers of Earth, with the goal of conquering the planet as his own domain by using humanity's technology against itself. To do this, Khan Digifer finds the social outcast, Takashi Toda, an angry, lonely middle schooler and an expert programmer, offering Takeshi a chance to finally get revenge against the world that constantly slights him. Any kaiju that Takashi creates in his digital art programs, Khan Digifer can bring to life, to wreak havoc on any machine he sends them within. With Khan Digifer's eventual plan being to destabilize and destroy enough of Earth's defenses to break into the real world, Gridman needs to stop him at any cost. Gridman informs Naoto that the two of them must combine for Gridman to be able to take a physical form within the machines Khan Digifer sends his kaiju to attack, 
With Yuka and Ipe having to stay behind to make sure Junk isn't overloaded by the damage Gridman may take during a fight, or if he spends too much time in the computer world. The basic structure of Denko Chojin Gridman follows this formula in a primarily Monster of the Week format, with Takashi not being aware of Naoto and Ko being Gridman's link to the human world, and vice versa. Each episode sees Takeshi come across an event or individual that sends him into a rage, leading to him and Kondigifer creating a new kaiju to destabilize a piece of technology that humans rely on, with Naoto, Yuka, and Ipe being called by Gridman through an acceptor wristband, which he entrusted to Naoto when trouble is afoot. At the utterance of the phrase, Access Flash, Gridman and Naoto combine to take down any kaiju within the computer world. Though on occasion, the show slightly deviates from this format. A different life lesson is covered in every episode with the goal of instilling good morals into the kids who would be watching. A typical approach that most children's TV takes in the pacing and execution of an episode. Where Gridman still stands out as unique, even from other tokusatsu series of the time, is how small-scale, yet creative and outright unhinged the show can get. Denko Chojin Gridman takes some very, very creative liberties with its setup. Episodes can range anywhere in concept, from Khan Digifer attempting to use the computer at a university to open a portal between dimensions, to Takashi trying to ruin a cake that Yuka is baking, by getting Khan Digifer to send a kaiju into her microwave. Conflicts can range from scenarios that seem apocalyptic to the most banal and basic of issues on a coin toss, all while still keeping this contained, small-town feel. And this manages to keep every episode of Gridman unique and fun. You never quite know what you're gonna get. Gridman only gets his sword, the fittingly titled Gridman Sword, because Ipe becomes so upset that his favorite snack, a local market special dog, is out of stock due to Khan Digifer screwing with the food supply chain, that he uses the image of the special dog stuck in his brain to quickly create a layout for a sword and shield combo. Another episode sees a music-loving kaiju, Anasilis, who lives within a mechanical keyboard, being taken over by Takeshi and Khan Digifer, and sent into a rage, which is only stopped once a being from the computer world, a life form known as a compoid, named Unison, works with Gridman to calm the big guy's nerves. And another eventually very important episode, where a mummy is brought back from the dead, mistaking Yuka for the princess he died to protect 4,000 years ago in ancient China. The show is silly through and through, and it's well aware of that, even during a majority of its more dramatic moments, barring one very specific episode I'll be discussing a bit later. And even in the case of parts of that episode, the show keeps an air of humor and absurdity over itself. I will never forget the image of Gridman using the power of kindness to help a wheelchair-bound loner walk again. Every episode keeps the show's focus firmly on the everyday person's reliance on ever-advancing technology, both the wonder it can bring as well as the fear and trepidation about this rapidly changing tech that many people had throughout the early 90s. The primary script writing for a bulk of the series was handled by Yasushi Hirano himself, though Mei Hirano, Isayo Shizuka, Kazuhiko Goto, and Toshimichi Okawa also served as scriptwriters on episodes for the show. But a fun setup, consistent throughline, and wacky scenarios can only go particularly far if the characters involved in them are equally engaging. And Gridman's cast rocks. The trio of Naoto, Ipe, and Yuka are the heart and soul of the series, each covering a specific character archetype while still exhibiting some real growth throughout the 39 episode run. Naoto starts off as more of an everyman protagonist. He's the clear audience surrogate in the show's first two episodes, getting very little aside from being Gridman's connection to the human world, not showing much in the way of personality outside of stoicism. But thankfully, this is quickly adjusted, and by the time the fifth episode rolls around, Naoto begins exhibiting actual traits that paint him as a somewhat realistic representation of a kid in his age range, displaying everything from petty jealousy over a crush, to getting incredibly worked up over the most minuscule of issues, showing clear frustration with the constantly absurd situations he's thrust into. But as the series runs its course, Naoto begins to mature quite a bit, and smoothly grows into the shoes of being a legitimately heroic figure in his own right, and not just the human host who's there to fuse with Gridman. Masaya Obi played Naoto in the series, and his performance is interesting. Obi was not an actor by trade, even in his late teenage years while working on this show, which leads to an occasionally stiff performance, with at times flat delivery and frankly bored-looking facial expressions. But when a scene really calls for it, he puts in just the right amount of effort to get at least the basic emotional response right. It's not an outright irredeemably horrible performance, but you should never go into a children's tokusatsu series like this expecting grade-A acting. And frankly, none of this really matters when his scream of pain is hilarious and kind of iconic. <laughs> Obi himself has also stated his disappointment in this performance in retrospect. In a 2019 interview for the Ushin Basetsu special issue focusing on Gridman, he reflected on his work on the show, stating, it's complicated in many ways, but at the time of the broadcast, I couldn't get emotionally involved in the story because I was in it, and all I could do was follow the action with my eyes. But now that so much time has passed, I can look at it freshly as a special effects work. That's the only reason why I would like to reshoot the series, if possible. I wish I had more ability at the time, however, being exposed to the staff at the time of the broadcast allowed me to learn many things that I could not have experienced at school, and I feel that has become the fertilizer of my life to this day. 
Obi currently runs a restaurant in Tokyo where he's mostly kept to himself these days, outside of Gridman-related events where he's shown up to show continued support for the series that he once starred in. But aside from that, he's not one to bring up the series beyond said events. Ipe is the tokusatsu and mecha nerd of the leading trio. He serves the role of the goofball of the crew, constantly getting caught up on more trivial issues, obsessing over complete nonsense, and generally just acting a fool regardless of the situation, but never in a way that comes across as obnoxious. He's just a kid with some silly expectations for his life, and at the end of the day he's still a valuable asset to the team, drafting the design of a new support weapon or assist unit to digitize into junk for Gridman to use. The references he makes to previous Ultra series are a welcome addition too, making him feel somewhat like a mouthpiece for the studio itself. The dude also has an immaculate sense of fashion. Bro has the most insane fits I've ever seen an actor in a 90s toku rock. This overall and Lakers hat combo is crazy. Name another character who would pull up to school dressed in this kind of getup. Takeshi Sudo's performance as Ipe is also the second strongest in the show. He understood the genuinely silly nature of the series and its conflicts and played directly into it, hamming up his performance just enough while not overstepping the limit of what most would usually consider annoying. Takeshi Sudo himself has only recently shown up in a brief but welcome interview in the Ushin Basetsu special issue on the original series. Ipe is a real one through and through though, and easily my favorite of the main trio. To balance out the crew, Yuka is the common sense and brains of the operation. The smartest of the group and easily the most resourceful, Yuka serves as the direct support for Gridman when he fuses with Naoto, sitting at junk and typing in commands to activate assist weapons and the henshin process itself. She also deploys quick thinking and ingenuity when the situation gets dicey. In the first few episodes, she has to type in everything she wants to say to Gridman directly, before realizing that if she installs a used sound card into junk, she can speak to him vocally and focus on command inputs. It's her sharp mind and dedication to her friend's well-being that makes her an invaluable part of the trio's formula. She keeps the nonsense that Naoto and Ipe try to pull sometimes in line. She also unfortunately finds herself at the receiving end of many of Takeshi's schemes, being his one-sided obsessive crush. Yuka is played by Jun Hattori, who only ever acted in Denko Chojin Gridman, before dropping out of acting altogether. Her performance is a little on the flat side, delivering most lines in a pretty unenthused manner. Though, much like Masaya Obi's performance as Naoto, when push comes to shove, she's able to get a good enough read out of a scene. It's unfortunate that she never acted after this, but this is often the case with many one-time child actors. While the leading trio is good fun, the best character in the show without question, and arguably one of the reasons the original Gridman is remembered as well as it is, is the legend himself, Takeshi Toto. Takeshi Toto is one of the greatest haters of all time. His meek and introverted image is contrasted by the sheer amount of burning rage this dude has towards anything and everything that mildly inconveniences him. It's downright iconic. Takeshi will blow up and get heated over anything. From getting a slightly lower test score than another classmate, loudly proclaiming that he hates all dogs after a bad experience with one, hating the local arcade for telling him that he's been gaming for too long and needs to give another kid a turn, and in one of his most iconic moments, this dude is such a hater that one of the episodes of the series is just outright titled, I Hate Sports. Takeshi's behavior is cartoonishly evil at times. This boy is unhinged in a way that most live-action children's show villains wish they could be. The absolute levels of tomfoolery he gets into with most of these episodes is a treat. Takeshi also surprisingly gets the most individual screen time in the show, with him and Khan Digifer being a much smaller operation than the junk trio in Gridman, it's actually that dynamic with Khan Digifer that helps make Takeshi such a memorable character. As the show goes on, despite his immature and erratic behavior, it's clear that at his core he's just a loner with no social skills, who at the end of the day actually wants to be part of the Junk Trio's circle. But his one-sided crush on Yuka, and often meek behavior in public, prevents this. On top of this, he doesn't even know that that crew is helping Gridman directly. Khan Digifer takes advantage of this, manipulating Takeshi's artistic skills and his kaiju designs by using him to create these beasts for his evil purposes getting revenge on anyone or anything that slights Takeshi. And when Takeshi disagrees with a given plan, Khan Digifer uses a form of brainwashing and sometimes outright electrocutes Takeshi until he gives in. It's an abusive power dynamic that helps make Takeshi a bit sympathetic, despite his unmatched hater energy. This all comes to a head in the best episode of the series by far, the 33rd episode, titled Another Takeshi. If you want to avoid loose spoilers I'm about to cover, skip to this timestamp. But this episode is necessary to discuss to really dive into his character, and I won't actually be going over its ending. Another Takeshi sees a boy who looks identical to Takeshi, named Takeo, becoming close friends with the Junk Trio. The episode explores the somber childhood Takeshi had, covering his close relationship with his grandmother, and general sadness that caused his introverted, aggressive, and even self-loathing nature to form in the first place. It paves the way for Takeshi's eventual redemption, in the show's concluding two-parter, which still unfortunately feels a tad too truncated, though the finale of the series in general is a bit on the fast side, so in that case Takeshi is more just a victim of circumstance. Takeshi is genuinely both a hilarious and at times even tragic character, who really completes the dynamic of the human characters in the show. 
He's played by Tsuyoshi Sugawara, who goes all in on his performance, hamming up every single aspect of the character and just being a joy to watch at all times. Whether Takeshi is on his extreme hater tip or just depressed, Tsuyoshi unfortunately, much like Jun Hattori, hasn't acted in anything after Gridman. Which is a shame because man, he is easily one of the highlights of the show. The rest of the human cast in the show serves purely as comic relief for most of its run. From Naoto's hilarious parents who constantly steal the show whenever they show up, to his little brother, Daichi, the lovable little gremlin as well as the bumbling police officers, Kagane Mura and Amagasaki, who can't get a single thing right. These side characters provide even more absurdity and clown shoes nonsense when the show calls for it, and I can see why kids might have loved this back when it was airing in 93. Much like Ipe in his similar moments though, it never treads into outright annoying territory. But the human cast is of course complemented by the show's titular hero and its dastardly villain. Gridman himself is pure heroic stoicism. He's not actually much of a quote-unquote character at all serving as the series' vehicle for its action scenes, and this works pretty well as Gridman himself is an extraterrestrial being, from another reality who simply took the form of the hero the Junk Trio created. He's an idea, the pure unfiltered image of a hero who always saves the day. The childhood dream made real, always persevering in the face of any challenge that comes his way, and destroying kaiju in style. So despite being the titular character, his actual presence in the series is more thematic than anything else. And this works really well for him. He's the source of good that brings the junk trio closer together, and really leaves room for them to shine. His voice is provided by veteran actor Hikaru Midorikawa, who plays the character with an intentionally somewhat robotic tone, though he still brings an air of professionalism to the acting in the show that's somewhat absent from the rest of the cast. Any stilted line that Gridman says feels done intentionally so. He sounds and acts like a comic book superhero through and through. This is helped by a filter applied to his voice that gives it a slight layer of artificiality. Khan Digifer, on the other hand, is comically evil, constantly chewing the scenery from the monitor in Takeshi's room he resides in. Whether it's his maniacal laugh or the ways in which he berates and manipulates Takeshi, the dude is pure evil and works perfectly as the villain for a children's tokusatsu series like this. His extremely stupid plans for world domination only help further sell his absurdity as an antagonist, though he isn't afraid of killing when the plan calls for it. In fact, he revels in being delightfully evil. Dude will murder a dog if he wants. Yes, Denko Chojin Gridman is very much on the list of media where a dog gets clapped. <laughs> Khan Digifer is voiced by another longtime anime industry performer, Masaharu Sato, who plays the role to corny perfection. His hammy laughter and gruff delivery helping sell Digifer's presence. He also plays off of Takeshi extremely well keeping the somewhat abusive dynamic the two have very consistent throughout the show's run. Outside of its characters and episode-by-episode -episode scenarios, the series' visuals are a mix of some very high highs and some obvious but very charming lows. Complementing the pretty enjoyable cast is Gridman's very home-movie feeling, brought on by the early digital video. Any scenes shot outside of the computer world set, the location where every major fight between Gridman and the Kaiju of the Week takes place, feels overall much cheaper than many of its toku contemporaries at the time, which is understandable as Tsuburaya was being very economical in how the series' budget was allocated. The neighborhood of Sakura Gaoka isn't a typical setting for a tokusatsu series, which would often be set in a major metropolitan area. But Sakura Gaoka is a far smaller town, about an hour by train outside of central Tokyo. It's one of the many residential areas that exist within the famous megacity, though a majority of the show was actually filmed half an hour away from Sakura Gaoka in Inagi. Seeing a more residential, less crowded part of Tokyo represented in the show helps emphasize the show's central idea that any kid with a dream can find joy and purpose. Locations become familiar and quickly recognizable over the course of the 39 episodes. You feel like you really get to know this town the way these characters do, and it helps sell the very local atmosphere the show is going for. It's an excellent example of taking full advantage of a more affordable shooting location from the typical bustling major city streets. What helps support this is the set of the basement where the junk crew hangs out. Its dingy, poorly lit space occupied by tons of used computer components helps sell its place as a sort of comforting, if makeshift hideout for the kids to always fall back on. Contrasting that is Takeshi's room, extremely clean and perfectly organized with a pale color palette. It has a very clinical, lonely feeling to it, as if it's a cubicle in an office. Great set designs such as this can tell you a lot about the character before they even speak. The big fight between Gridman and the weekly Kaijo at the final stretch of each episode is clearly where Tsuburaya's team flexes their talents, and where a majority of the series' budget, along with the suits, was allocated. With an incredibly intricate, highly detailed set drenched in shadow, serving as a visual representation of the computer world within each piece of technology, filmed right within one of Toei's warehouses that Tsuburaya had rented out for the run of the series. A set that's consistently reused to its benefit, with new quote-unquote buildings added in each episode for the kaiju to demolish. The set has a deep blue lighting covered in a soft fog, 
which visually complements the colorful makeshift circuit board-like cities that make up the environment of the computer world. I can't sing the praises of the computer world set enough. It's an absolute feat of filmmaking and practical effects that truly speaks volumes to Super Eye Productions' endless strengths as a studio, and Kazuo Sagawa's excellent work as a showrunner and practical effects director. The series also features fantastic costume design through and through, beautifully translating Kazumitsu Akamatsu's mechanical and monster designs from the concept art to reality. Gridman's suit is a fantastic blend of classic Ultra Series design elements, mixed with the more mechanical, clunky look of the robots of Takara's toy lines. His red and black bodysuit contrasting well with his steel armor, the bright glow of his eyes and chest crystal helping him stand out at all times. Even when the lighting is slightly darker in the computer world, the blue gem atop his head letting out a soft, repeated glow as he runs out of energy a la many of the Ultras before him, though in the first two episodes of the show, those shoulder pads of his are a bit loose, which is charming in its own right, but pretty distracting. They quickly get reinforced on the prop for the rest of the show, though. Gridman himself, of course, isn't the only great design in the show. The support units are all fantastic as well, such as the vehicular Thunderjet, Twin Driller, and God Tank, three units which can combine together into the extremely Takara design of God Zenon. A chunky mech controlled remotely from junk by Ipe and Yuka, with one of the funniest walk cycles in the history of television. Look at that big man go. The three of these units can also combine with Gridman himself as a suit of armor, turning him into the very gaudy, but exceptionally sturdy looking Thunder Gridman. The mighty Draconic Cannon can also be used by Gridman as a powerful blaster. The cannon can also transform into the mobile jet, Dynafighter, which can fuse with the final major support unit, the King Jet, a giant fortress that can tear through the skies and assist Gridman in battle when docked with the Dynafighter. That's not enough, the King Jet and Dynafighter can transform into the mighty Dyna Dragon another powerful mech based on a Tyrannosaurus that looks like a 10-year-old boy's perfect idea of what the coolest thing imaginable is. And that is genuine praise, as all of these upgrades and support vehicles were built to push toy sales, and they succeeded in spades, as Gridman did quite well in terms of pushing merchandise and action figures. If Gridman combines with the King Jet, he can also use a second armored form called King Gridman, which is my favorite design in the show overall. Being a gorgeous hybrid of classic, chunky rectangular shapes that's a signature of Akamatsu's design work at Takara, and the bright, striking color palette of Tsuburaya's props and costume design. Aside from Gridman himself, the kaiju he battles are equally memorable, with the primary design work being handled by Kazumitsu Akamatsu and Masayuki Fukugawa. All of the kaiju in the series look fantastic and distinct, from the soft-eyed Anacillus, to the show's most famous kaiju, Shinoblar, a ninja kaiju with a primarily purple color palette, complemented by glowing red and yellow gems adorning his body. He's also one of the few kaiju that talks in his appearances, and serves as the most repeatedly used enemy. But my personal favorite kaiju in the series is hands down Goromaking, a punk rock kaiju who's an absolute riot in the fantastic episode he's featured in. Every kaiju in the show is memorable in its own right though, from the goofier side like Telebos, to the imposing gas kaiju, Venora. Another excellent choice made for the series Kaiju is that their internals are all modeled after cheap wiring, having colored cables running through the exposed parts of their body that Gridman breaks, reminding you of the fact that these are digital beasts residing within machines. Aside from the fantastic designs and prop work found in the series, equal praise needs to be given to the series' fight choreography. No two battles in Gridman look or feel the same, even while wrapped in the show's Monster of the Week format. Gridman's suit actor, Hiroyuki Okano, shows an incredible range of athleticism and variety throughout the show. His ability to work around the more stiff-moving kaiju suits keeps fights exciting and fresh. What also helps contribute to Gridman's battles is the sense of scale. Despite taking place inside of a computer world, Gridman and the respective Kaiju of the Week are still intended to tower over the rest of the set. Super Eye Productions was and still is the studio when it comes to battles between giants. The entirety of the Ultra series had been built on these smackdowns between building-sized characters, and Gridman carries that approach forward. There's a real sense of tangible weight to every movement pulled off by the suit actors. Every impact and stunt carries the same power and scale that's required to sell the imposing size of Gridman and the Kaiju. Even as some Kaiju get reused in the latter half of the show, the fights themselves are always kept fresh thanks to the universally solid suit acting and direction. Gridman's practical effects are easily the most impressive part of the show on a technical level, but the most noticeable and often criticized aspect of its visuals are how its VFX and CG work hold up today. Gridman's digital effects have aged horribly, and in my opinion, that's part of what still makes the show an entertaining watch. Gridman is a product of its time. Digital effects in early 90s children's TV shows never looked particularly strong. The only visual effects from that era that still hold up under any scrutiny were found in lavish Hollywood productions with access to top-of-the-line resources and large-scale productions. Gridman was a weekly show on a production cycle of episodes being filmed less than a month before their air date. That and Tsuburaya's staff had never worked with D2 video as a format before meaning that both time and experience was working against the series. And even with all that said, I'm sorry, but some of these effects are just too funny not to love. The goofy flying PNGs of cropped hospital equipment in Episode 1, the hilarity of watching Gridman awkwardly enter the computer world for a fight, it's all great, 
I mean, just look at my dude go. There is something so endlessly hilarious about watching images get stretched and squashed over cheap green screen composites. Every time Dino Dragon or God Zenon activate, you can't help but giggle a little at how absurd the sight of it all is. Naoto getting sucked into junk also never ceases to amuse me. And it's not as if all of the digital effects in the show are bad. Gridman's Grid Beam and Fixer Beam both look good and match the quality of the Ultra Beam from the earlier Ultraman series. His growth sequence also looks great, as it again builds off of Tsuburaya's work on the Ultra series. Gridman's VFX are very dated and were not top of the line even for the time, but their messy, ridiculous look, mixed with D2 Video's pretty sharp analog image, adds to the show's unique look and tone. It ends up being one of the most signature attributes of the show's identity. Outside of the series' visuals, its soundtrack is also fantastic. Helmed by veteran composer Osamu Totsuka, the soundtrack primarily consists of jazz with MIDI compositions, creating for a comforting, very chill soundtrack that fits the series' tone and mix of organic and digital perfectly. The most frequently played track, through the 39 episode run is Futatsu no Yuki, an earworm of a track that serves as one of the soundtrack's main leitmotifs. A vocal version of the song which never actually plays in the show proper is featured on the full OST, but easily the best track in the entire show is its opening theme, Yume no Hero, performed by Norio Sakai, a track that has outlived the show itself in many circles, going on to widely be considered one of the greatest tokusatsu opening themes ever put to tape. The song is legitimately incredible, and almost overshadows the equally fantastic ending theme, Moto Kimi wo Shireba, also performed by Sakai, a song that captures a sense of childhood wonder and youthful joy, fittingly focusing on the series' main themes of dreams and young passion. Denko Chojin Gridman is all around a great show, and despite some very obvious rough spots, it remains a fun watch to this day. All 39 episodes are a blast in their own right, and even with a slightly rushed conclusion to Takeshi's character arc in the finale, it honestly still holds up quite well. Don't go in expecting high art, of course. But what you are getting is a great piece of early 90s children's TV that's a blast to sit through. You can feel the passion the production crew on the show had, even through some of its slightly weaker elements. It truly feels like a labor of love. Give Gridman a shot if you never have. It's got an official Blu-ray release from Mill Creek, which unfortunately uses some very rough subtitles. There were also previously on the streamable versions of the show on Amazon and Toku, though these official subs are hilarious in their own right, translating basic conversations that characters have into the occasionally absurd with characters often shouting, Jesus Christ, what the hell is wrong with you? The subs aren't the most accurate and are pretty poorly edited in places, but even looking past those subs, the show's script is fairly simple to follow even with limited Japanese knowledge. Gridman is great, it serves as a solid foundation for a series to be built on, and holds up reasonably well. But unfortunately, around the time of its finale, on Christmas 1993, the situation back at Tsuburaya itself was a bit different. Gridman was a relative hit in terms of TV ratings, climbing from a slightly underwhelming 3% audience metric with its first episode, all the way up to a very healthy 8-10% for a majority of its TV run. To put that into perspective, that's a bit under half the viewership that the monolith that is Dragon Ball Z was getting at the time, which was extremely impressive for Super Mario's first proper TV show in 12 years. Takara was also reporting solid toy sales. Everything looked set for more Gridman, but back at Super Mario Productions, the show had run into a few snags. While the series concluded its run at a strong 39 episodes, a handful of ideas the writers had wanted to explore had been left on the cutting room floor, and one of these ideas, which was initially pitched to occur halfway through the show's run, was to have Khan Digifer give Takeshi his own digital body to combine with, a color-swapped evil clone of Gridman that would be titled Khan Knight. Eventually, this turn of events would lead to Takeshi's redemption, betraying Khan Digifer and joining the junk team as Grid Knight. This idea was dropped completely as the show's production cycle left little room for a shakeup this significant to work. Not much is known about how this may have played out, outside of the information that was shared in the 2019 Ushin Basetsu special issue for Gridman. But the idea of Takashi turning to the side of good was something that Tsuburaya wanted to explore for a sequel series. Unfortunately, as the production of Denko Chojin Gridman was winding down, and the final few episodes were being worked on, network executives at TBS believed that while the series was a decent hit, it was time for Ultraman to make its return. Tsuburaya having proven that it can make a smaller scale show, such as Gridman, gave producers the idea to finally take another shot at a mainline Ultra series. While all of this was great for the return of the sci-fi classic, Gridman would have to be pushed to the sidelines. It didn't help matters that Tsuburaya would decide to take their production to the USA, leading Tsuburaya to be stretched thin in late 1993 as two productions were occurring at once. The final few episodes of Gridman, as well as an American co-production called Ultraman The Ultimate Hero. With two simultaneous productions going down on two separate parts of the world, the solid TV performance of Gridman wasn't enough to support both productions at the same time. It didn't help matters that Ultraman the Ultimate Hero ended up being a disastrous production that only ever released in Japan direct-to-video, not even airing in the US, the country it was filmed and produced in. A toy line was also released for the Ultimate Hero that completely bombed throughout Asia, 
which again was due to the show not airing on any kind of TV station and only being a direct-to-video release, causing Subaraya to bleed money quickly. This led to an unfortunate situation where a planned second season of Gridman would have to be put on ice. As all of Tsuburaya reconvened in Japan, to assess the damages of overshooting the bar and taking on two productions at once, the company would have to use 1994 as a bit of a buffer year, with Kazuo Tsuburaya stepping down as producer and becoming company president, to see them through their hardest years since the late 80s. Despite the unsure future of the Gridman series at the time, Kazumitsu Akamatsu expressed the desire to still develop a sequel of some sort. Wanting to create more designs in kaiju, making use of props that had already been made, Tsuburaya would give Akamatsu their blessing to develop a Takeshi-starring sequel, though of course this would not take the form of a television series or movie. Instead, this new Gridman project would release as a special series of short stories in Shogakukan Televikun magazine throughout 1994. The title was Denko Chojin Gridman, The Demon King's Counterattack. Demon King's counterattack focused on a now-reformed Takeshi, as he's contacted by the younger brother of Gridman, Gridman Sigma, who warns him of the approaching threat of Khan Digifer's brother, Neo Khan Digifer, who seeks to take down Gridman out of revenge for the conclusion of the TV series. The short story was accompanied by a series of photo shoots, with Gridman's suit being reused, as Tsuburaya would also create a new suit for Gridman Sigma, having the two stand side by side for promotional and action shots. Neo Khan Digifer and the kaiju he brought along with him would be miniature models produced internally at Takara, instead of Tsuburaya. Kazumitsu Akamatsu would get Masayuki Fukugawa to return along with him to design these miniatures. Takara did a bulk of the heavy lifting for the Demon King's counterattack, as it was strictly overseen by Akamatsu, wanting to still explore more stories with the designs he had worked so tirelessly on. While the short story gives Takeshi a nice added layer of closure, it's still a shame that this was only presented through short text and a series of photographs. I know I'm not the only one who would have loved the full-scale Toku sequel or film to have happened, but you still have to respect Akamatsu a ton for keeping the series running for another year in some capacity. Aside from the Demon King's counterattack, another proposed sequel story titled Denko Chojin Gridman F was thrown around internally at Tsuburaya as a potential project. This pitch would follow Gridman as he teamed up with a new host, this time an older high schooler and a classmate of Ipe's named Yuta, in a bid to save another high schooler, Akane, from the clutches of a new villain, Alexis Carib, and his own personal army of kaiju. The idea at the time didn't make many waves within the studio, as the only returning cast member from the original show was proposed to be Ipe, and that the studio was too busy restructuring to focus on a new production. And that was it for Gridman for the longest time. A successful show that's proposed sequels were either released as a short story or put entirely on ice. 1995, Tsuburaya would broadcast Ultraman Great, a Japanese subtitled version of Ultraman Towards the Future, and Ultraman Powered the Japanese subtitled version of Ultraman The Ultimate Hero. While they worked on the next full Ultraman installment, Ultraman Neos, which every TV network promptly rejected, meaning that in late 1995, Tsuburaya had to restructure once again and give the Ultra series one last Hail Mary. A Hail Mary that would happen to save the entire franchise and the company again, Ultraman Tiga, which would see itself air in 1996. The hero created by the dreams of three young children would rest, as he powered off for the time being. At least, he powered off in Japan, that is because the original 93 show would happen to find new life halfway across the world. The evil Kilo Khan lives inside computer circuits. With the help of Malcolm Frink, he creates megavirus monsters to attack electronic systems. Meanwhile, a freak accident turns Sam Collins into Servo. His friends join forces in their samurai's attack vehicles. Together, they transform into the Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad! Superhuman Samurai! In 1993, as Gridman was airing in Japan, across the Pacific in the United States, Tokusatsu had finally gained a foothold in America, thanks to the smash success of Saban's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, an American rework of Toei's Super Sentai series that reused and recut footage of Kyoryu Sentai Zoo Ranger, mixed along with original footage starring American actors. I don't think I need to go into detail about just how massive Power Rangers became. It's still what a majority of people know as their only exposure to Tokusatsu at all. But of course, with the absurd billion dollar hit that producers Haim Saban and Shuki Levy had crafted with their licensing and rework of Toei's Japanese staple, every children's television network wanted a piece of that money green ranger pie. One of the first production companies to attempt this would be Deke Entertainment, a studio that was a staple of 80s and 90s children's programming in the US. Deke producer Andy Hayward, who had developed some bad blood with Haim Saban over a collapsed music licensing agreement, wanted to try and steal a piece of Saban's pie. He would strike up a deal with Super Raya Productions and TBS to purchase the license to use stock footage from Denko Chojin Gridman, using the show's excellent fight scenes as the backdrop for his own Power Rangers equivalent. With the fight footage acquired, Deke would be left to handle all the necessary original footage themselves, 
Future iCarly director and Dan Schneider collaborator Adam Weissman would take up the mantle of director for the original non-Gridman footage in the show, with Disney veterans Jim Magon and Mark Zaslov assigned to writing duties. The series was initially set to be titled Power Boy, before Deke understandably stepped back from that, as the intentions were a tad too obvious and legally dubious. Deke would strike a deal with Playmates Toys to produce merchandise for the show. Instead of working with the far more expensive Takara, Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad would become the series' finalized title, and it would begin airing September 4, 1994 on ABC. Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad is an interesting case. Unlike its contemporary in Power Rangers, no original suit footage was shot for the series. It only had the existing Gridman footage to take from, meaning that judging the series for elements that were already good in the original series would be a redundant practice. So for this segment, I'll focus on the exclusively original elements of the show, and how the Gridman footage is integrated. Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad is 52 episodes as opposed to the 39 of Gridman, meaning that fights and entire sequences are reused on numerous occasions and cut together awkwardly, with much of the focus in the show's final stretch sticking almost entirely to the original characters and sets. And unfortunately, most of the series' original ideas are far from refined. Cyber Squad is a show that goes about its execution in half-steps. There's a few legitimately solid non-Gridman elements buried in here that occasionally shine through, but the show itself is a rough watch. Part of this comes down to the series' terrible production schedule and minuscule budget, with Jim Magon and Mark Zaslov explaining on the Mr. TV podcast in late 2020 that scripts and episode production were done in chunks of 2 to 4 a week, with episodes having to be filmed in chunks of 5 a week, making the entire process extremely fast and extremely low budget, being far cheaper on a production front than many of its TV contemporaries. Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad follows Sam Collins, a super 90s cool kid who one day through a freak accident gets transported inside of his home computer. Within the PC, he takes the form of the digital superhero, Servo. Meanwhile, an evil military-designed computer virus named Kilocon has made its way into the personal computer of the school owner and general outcast, Malcolm Frink, the two of them partnering up to wreak havoc on the daily lives of other students. Sam and his friends, Sydney, Tanker, and Amp, Fight to take down the computer viruses that Malcolm and Kilocon seek to spread throughout the show's 52 episode run. Cyber Squad's cast is pretty one note aside from three exceptions. There really isn't much to talk about when it comes to the main group of Sam, Sydney, Tanker, or Amp. The four of them have a fine enough group dynamic, but dry dialogue and the show's generally limited resources prevent them from ever being too memorable. Amp is also replaced for the final 16 episodes of the show by a new character named Lucky, who's just Amp too, but not quite. I will say that I'll never forget Tanker's face, because he looks way too much like Martin Cabello III. Cocaina. No. Flower. Somebody just asked me um, why I hate the military. Sam is also played by longtime TV actor Matthew Lawrence, who according to Magon and Zaslov, was constantly being pulled from project to project. With Matthew Lawrence still being 14 years old and in high school at the time, he would also have to leave the set early to attend classes, meaning that the show's lead was never around for full shooting days. Thankfully, there are three standout characters and performances in the show, the first being the central antagonist, Malcolm Frank. Malcolm is a riot. Where Takeshi in the original contrasted his meek nature with sheer hater energy, Malcolm is just a freak from episode 1. This dude is an absolute gem to watch and easily the best part of the show overall. Whenever the show cuts away from Sam and his crew to Malcolm, it feels like having cold water splashed on your face as the show becomes engaging. Malcolm was played by Native American actor Glenn Bowden, who kills it in the role. You can tell he was having a blast filming every episode, and genuinely has excellent chemistry with the rest of the cast. Unfortunately, according to Bowden on the Mr. TV podcast in 2020, he only earned $350 per episode, a garbage pay rate even by 1994 children's TV standards. In fact, nearly the entire cast was paid this measly amount aside from Matthew Lawrence and one other much larger name. So the fact that he put his all into this role and genuinely had a great time doing it is commendable. The second standout is Kilocon, played by none other than the legendary Tim Curry. And now it makes sense as to why the rest of the cast was paid in pennies. Curry absolutely nails it as Kilocon, matching the energy of Khan Digifer perfectly while putting in his own spin, berating Malcolm constantly by calling him a meat puppet or meat thing. Their dynamic is fantastic and a nice change of pace from Takeshi and Khan Digifer, as Kilocon and Malcolm banter back and forth, constantly pushing against each other but learning to deal with each other's crap to get the job done. It's legitimately fun, and as I said before, the best part of the show. Tim Curry's laugh at the end of every episode is also fantastic. <laughs> the final high point of the series is the lunch lady, Miss Starkey. Played by the late character actor Diana Bellamy, Miss Starkey, who's named after Ringo Starr, this show has a lot of Beatles references in all around, which is an odd choice, is just the best. Whatever weird sequences or absurd lines Magan and Zaslav wrote for her, she goes all in on, an absolute trooper of an actress and a legitimately funny character on top of it. In terms of actual production values, again, Cyber Squad was made on the cheap, very cheap. From the low pay rates the majority of the cast received, to the opening of episode 1 being reused wholesale well into the 20s, the show was given very little to work with to begin with aside from the Gridman fights. 
which as I stated earlier had to be looped and reused due to the bloated episode count. The show also only features four sets. Sam's bedroom, Malcolm's room, the school cafeteria, and a hallway in the school. And due to this, there's practically no variety in locations, with the show taking a very dry, sitcom approach to its framing, leaving everything aside from the reused Gridman footage visually very uninteresting. Aside from Malcolm's dank-ass closet room, which has at least some personality to it. Also, after having 51 episodes filmed back-to-back -back and having the small sets torn down, months later, ABC would order a 52nd and final episode, with Magan and Zaslav rushing back to throw together an episode that they had to end up filming in a park, with Sam and Malcolm nowhere to be found. Honestly, a fitting end for such a bizarre note in Gridman's history. There isn't much else to say about Cyber Squad, aside from noting some interesting name changes it made to all the support units. While Gridman is renamed to Servo, and the activation phrase of Access Flash was changed to the far less interesting, let's samurais, guys. The support weapons were renamed to Tracto Max, Buster Boar, and Skyvitter, which are all honestly way more interesting titles than Thunderjet, Twin Driller, and God Tank in my opinion. God Zenon is also called just Zenon here, which is for pretty obvious reasons, I don't think calling a toy god of any sort would have flown in the US. Cyber Squad's soundtrack is also impossible to track down, with only the German version of the show's OST, which is an entirely different soundtrack by the way, ever being made available to purchase. Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad is a slightly interesting piece of tokusatsu history, but not much else. Its very cheap, quick turnaround style production made it clear that at the end of the day, this was Andy Hayward's attempt to get Deke a piece of that Power Rangers profit, and a rush job of one at that. But even then, you can still tell the cast and writers at least had fun working on the show, in spite of these conditions. So it's not all bad. If you're curious to check out Cyber Squad, the first DVD release is out of print but has been preserved on the Internet Archive. The second half of the series is still in print and available for cheap by way of DHX Media. Cyber Squad has its fans, and that's understandable, as a lot of it does come down to nostalgia from watching it while it was airing. But aside from that, it's an otherwise odd side note in Gridman's overall history. The late 90s to the early 2000s was an insane period for the house that built Gridman, putting out some of the best pieces of sci-fi television in the process, and firmly put Subaraya back in the position of power they were in in the 60s and early 70s. But the primary focus over the two decades after Denko Chojin Gridman was firmly on Ultra, with only a handful of non-Ultra side projects releasing. Most notably the 13-episode 2006 tokusatsu, Bioplanet Wu. As for Gridman, it would receive an eventual DVD re-release and was still listed proudly among Tsuburaya's series. But in terms of new material, the series was considered dead for the most part. The only new material the series really ever got was fan books. Such as the 1996 fan-written guidebook, All About the Denko Chojin Gridman, penned by Kurosame Kenbutai. It's mainly a one-to-one -one archive covering every episode of the series, and going over all the filming locations in Sakura Goka, as well as Inahi. The book is a really great example of early fan archiving though, but it's very out of print. The copy I have is from 1996, as it was only sold twice at two Comicettes. I've decided to scan the book and archive it. I've linked to my upload of it on archive.org in the description. The 2010s would eventually come around, and business would continue as usual with Subaraya, still cranking out ultra shows, specials, and movies. But around 2014, Studio Trigger, an at the time new anime studio helmed by former Gainax alumni Hiroyuki Imaishi and Masahiko Otsuka, having just come off of the international success of their debut TV anime, Kill la Kill, was looking to take on more projects. The fledgling studio was home to many young up-and-coming animators, as well as some of Imaishi's former Gainax colleagues, one of them being Akira Amamiya, an animator who was seen as the protege of Imaishi, having worked as an episode storyboarder, assistant director, and key animator on Kill la Kill, as well as helming his own series, the comedy web anime Inferno Cop, a show that was a send-up to the media Amamiya loved, such as Kamen Rider Black and American adult cartoons aired on the likes of Adult Swim. The show became a bit of a cult hit, getting a very positive reception, and after directing it, plus his work as an assistant director on Kill la Kill, the idea of him directing a full series felt like it was coming in no time. Having always had a deep love for the Ultra series, as many in the anime industry did, Amamiya, while workshopping some ideas around Studio Trigger, would reach out to Tsuburaya Productions, asking if there was a chance that the two studios could collaborate on a new Ultraman anime adaptation. Though Tsuburaya wasn't willing to give the rights of their Golden Goose away to just anybody, firm in their position that Ultra as a franchise would remain under lock and key for the foreseeable future. Despite this, Amamiya had recently been assigned a slot for the Japan Animator Expo, an upcoming event organized by Hideaki Anno's studio Kara that was set to run from late 2014 to late 2015, and serve as a platform for animators from across the nation to show off original anime shorts, unrestricted by studio interference, and allowing anime directors to really flex their capabilities and style. This included some exceptionally popular shorts, such as the controversial yet very viral Me Me Me, directed by Hibiki Yoshizaki, 
All of the shorts would air weekly online in sequential order. And seeing this as an opportunity, Amamiya asked Tsuburaya once again if he could possibly use another existing IP of theirs to adapt into a submission for the Animator Expo. They offered him the choice between Andromelos or Gridman. Having fond memories of the original series airing while he was a child, and having gained a deeper love of it when he rewatched the show as a teenager, Gridman was the obvious choice for him. Amamiya was also an avid collector of Takara-produced toys, such as Transformers. I mean, just look at the man's desk. And of course, Gridman was a huge part of this. Being a cornerstone of his childhood right next to Ultraman, Tsuburaya was happy to hand the up-and-coming director the keys to Gridman, and Amamiya would move forward with the production of his short, getting Studio Kara's own Hidemi Lee on board to handle editing duties, and Eiji Tsuchida to cover cinematography as well as a team of assistant animators and effects artists. The team led by Amamiya would complete the short by the end of 2014, and it would air on Nico Nico on January 16th, 2015, under the title, Denko Chojin Gridman, Boys Invent Great Hero. Boys Invent Great Hero is a five-minute, extremely passionate love letter to the original tokusatsu, its narrative device being a now-adult Takeshi walking through the streets of Tokyo. The sky filled with the mysterious silhouettes of Kaiju. Finding Junk, now resting in a trash heap, he reflects on all of the major battles Gridman won in the original series, with the short highlighting every support weapon, combined form, signature attack, and all of the major Kaiju from the series. Presented in a kinetic, fast-paced battle montage, set to Motokimi Oshireba from the original series. It's a wonderful, very nostalgia-packed reflection on the best elements of the original show, and it ends on an incredible note for fans, with Takeshi revealing his own acceptor, yelling Access Flash, and transforming into Gridman Sigma, now off to battle those mysterious kaiju in Tokyo. The short received unanimous praise from fellow animators, Tsuburaya itself, and general audiences, who were given an unexpected childhood throwback that spurred an emotional response from many. Tsuburaya quickly realized that they had made the right choice in allowing Amamiya to express his love for a childhood favorite like this and came to him with a new proposition, a full 12-episode TV anime that would be a co-production between Studio Trigger and Tsuburaya Productions. Amamiya immediately accepted as he and Tsuburaya hashed out concepts. In late 2015, Amamiya would find himself busy directing another short web anime, an adaptation of the American novel series Ninja Slayer. 2016 would also see him co-direct Space Patrol Luluko with Hiroyuki Imaishi. Once he had completed his duties on those fronts, he would gather a team of young talent working at Studio Trigger together. Now in his late 30s, Amamiya hoped to use Gridman as a platform to let the next generation of animators at the studio flex their talents, along with creating a love letter to a show he adored so much. The series would be titled SSSS Gridman, the four S's being a nod to superhuman samurai cyber squad. Amamiya was a true fan of Gridman, and he knew he needed to bring his A-game to this production and truly show his capabilities as a series director and the team at Trigger's immense talent, and what they would create was a bit special. Formally revealed to the public at Anime Expo 2017, SSSS Gridman would be Studio Trigger's first of two major collaborative projects to air the following year in 2018. Their first being a mecha collaboration with A1 Pictures, Darling in the Franks, and the second, set to air at the end of 2018, would be SSSS Gridman, Akira Amamiya's lead directorial debut on a TV anime. Amamiya, working closely with Tsuburaya Productions, workshop the main concept for this exciting Gridman reboot. He landed on taking some of the unused concepts from the shelved Gridman F, taking Yuta, Akane, Alexis Carob, as well as the kaiju silhouettes looming over the city from Boys Invent Great Hero, while removing Ipe as it had been over 20 years since the ideas for F had been workshopped. From here, Amamiya, having had some scripting experience, writing a handful of short stories including a Yuri-themed one titled The Uniform from a School I Don't Recognize, attempted to write a series rough draft, attempting to match the pace of a 90s tokusatsu series intended to sell toys, though he quickly realized in general he wasn't cut out for scripting a full TV series narrative. Going to Tsuburaya, he explained that he needed a proper screenwriter to help the series actually succeed. Tsuburaya, in turn, called upon one of the best writers in the anime and tokusatsu industry, Keiichi Hasegawa, an industry vet who had serious critical acclaim under his belt, having had a significant role in writing Ultraman Antigua, Ultraman Gaia, The Big O's First Half, Zoid's Chaotic Century and New Century, and many more in the years that would follow. But his own crowning achievements were widely considered his work as the lead writer of the fantastic Ultraman Dyna in 1997, and debatably the best entry in the entire Ultraman franchise, 2004's Ultraman Nexus. A show with such a fascinating history itself that it warrants its own entirely separate, equally detailed retrospective. Hasegawa was a writer that Amamiya considered far above his level when it came to collaborating on a project. Stating in a 2018 interview with Japanese entertainment site Natalie, in the midst of it, Tsuburai Productions told me I could talk with Hisagawa-san. 
I remember my surprise because I really liked the Heisei Ultra series, and I always considered Hasegawa-san was someone above the clouds. With Heisegawa now serving as the series scriptwriter, he would work closely with Amamiya, enhancing ideas for set pieces, character arcs, and the general central themes of the story, all while filling in the gaps Amamiya was unable to himself. Amamiya and the rest of the animation team would plan for which episode would have the appearance of which new form or power-up, as Hasegawa would add depth to tie the classic action scenes and characters together. This resulted in a very focused approach with the series' writing, and in turn its production schedule moved along without much of a hitch. And October 7th, 2018 on Tokyo MX, SSSS Gridman would finally make its television debut. SSSS Gridman begins with a high school student, Hibiki Yuta, waking up in a house he doesn't recognize. Suffering from amnesia, the girl sitting across from him explains that she's his classmate, Rika Takarada, filling him in on how he suddenly passed out in front of her home while walking with her that afternoon. While trying to retrace his steps, Yuta hears a mysterious voice calling out to him, before he discovers that it's coming from a familiar-looking old computer, located in the store that Rika and her mother run, the junk shop. He also soon takes notice of giant silhouettes covering the city skyline, which Rika is unable to see, along with her being unable to hear the voice coming from the old computer. At school the next day, Yuta meets Utsumi Sho, a mecha and Ultraman fanboy who claims to be friends with Yuta pointing out how odd his amnesia and behavior is. He also comes to know the most popular student in the school, and generally sweet-seeming girl, Akane Shinjo. When evening comes and a kaiju suddenly appears, destroying massive chunks of the city, that voice calls out to Yuta again. Rushing back to the junk shop, the computer suddenly turns on, with the figure inside of the screen calling himself Gridman, and telling Yuta that the two of them need to combine in order for Gridman to take a physical form and fight the kaiju. With Rika and Utsumi shocked that they can suddenly see and hear the strange being on the computer, Yuta is given Gridman's acceptor, and told to access Flash as the two combine and destroy the kaiju. Though somehow, the next morning, all of the damage that had been done to the city is repaired with no explanation. That is, except for anyone who died during the previous night's kaiju attack, with those who were unlucky enough to be caught up in the midst of that erased from everybody's memory. Except for that of the main trio. In the backdrop of all of this, Akane Shinjo seems to be not all she's made out to be, as it appears these odd happenings of late may be her doing. The setup for SSSS Gridman is very similar to that of the original show. A trio of youths put into contact with Gridman as he seeks to defeat Kaiju, created by another classmate they're unaware is the cause of all of this. Though it's from this similar setup that SSSS Gridman grows into a very special show all on its own. Unfortunately, it's a bit hard to talk about the themes of SSSS Gridman without diving into the character of Akane Shinjo, and discussing some heavy spoilers. So in this segment, I'm going to dance around as many of those spoilers as possible, while while still discussing the show's central theme. SSSSS Gridman is truly more of a character study on Akane Shinjo, that mostly does a decent job giving ample screen time to the rest of its cast. While revisiting and celebrating the strengths of the original Tokusatsu series and exploring far deeper themes that are much more resonant with adult and teenage audiences, SSSS Gridman's first five episodes follow a very typical Monster of the Week structure, beat for beat quite close to the original series, as a new weapon, or, you know, in this case, toy, is introduced to fight the respective Kaiju of the Week. The only element absent from each episode is having its own moral to present to the kids watching at home, as SSSS Gridman was made with older audiences in mind, and this purpose becomes all the more clear around episode 6 and onward, where the series begins to reveal the cards in its hand, morphing the show from a great tribute to the original series in structure and style, to a proper, beautiful thematic sequel as well that adds a layer of depth to the franchise, and even helps elevate its precursor. SSSS Gridman is the story of one very bored, very lonely girl, and her personal journey towards self-recovery by way of those around her, united by a superhero born from the dreams of children two decades prior. SSSSS Gridman is one hell of a sequel series, and yes, it is in fact a very direct sequel to the original Tokusatsu. While it can still very comfortably be watched as a standalone story, the way in which it builds upon and matures the themes of the original show is made that much stronger when compared and contrasted to what came before. SSSS Gridman is the story of recovery and self-acceptance in the face of crippling isolation and loneliness. This is mainly accomplished through Akane's fantastic character arc, but SSSSS Gridman in general has a pretty decent cast. Said cast is a throwback to the original series without outright copying those characters wholesale. Hibiki Yuta is an interesting case as a protagonist. He's a generally nervous, introverted teen who carries himself awkwardly through conversations, only really talking to Utsumi at first, and fumbling his attempts to interact with Rika, who he has what he feels is a one-sided crush on. He's filled with guilt at being unable to retain any of his memories even those of his own parents, only being able to live life on a day-to-day -day basis, as he tries to adjust to the world around him. That is, until it's time for action. Because once Gridman comes calling, something changes in Yuta. A spark of heroism awakens in him, as if a voice is calling out to him, telling him that battling these kaiju is something only he can do. It's in these moments where he becomes a focused lead, willing to lay down his life and risk bodily harm if it means stopping these kaiju. As the series progresses and Yuta learns more truths about both himself and the secrets of the world, he becomes steadfast in his central goal of saving those around him, and regaining those lost memories, with one person in particular becoming central to his motivation. 
Unfortunately, due to the series playing coy with his past until the very end, Yuto really is half of a character despite being the supposed lead. It sadly drags him down from how good he could have been, though this is a very intentional choice by Hasegawa as it ties into one of the series' main plot twists. Though it unfortunately gives you little reason to get invested in him, with the story around him really being the main draw. He's voiced by Yuya Hirose, who at the time was very new to the voice acting scene. Despite a small body of work in the VA business, Hirose puts on a very convincing performance as Yuta, capturing the awkward nature of a pubescent teenage boy while mixing it with the sense of confusion brought on by his amnesia. And when it comes to Yuta in his more heroic moments, Hirose gets those lungs moving. The man can yell one hell of an access flash. Utsumi Sho is a semi-audience slash studio insert. He's a blatant fanboy for everything Tsuburaya, constantly referencing the Ultra series, and using his knowledge of its tropes to make attempts at assisting Yuta and Gridman during a battle. Utsumi is frankly just a nerd all around, but a more believable one than the usual quote-unquote high school nerd stereotype. He enjoys the little things in life, whether that's tokusatsu or just having a simple mano -a mano chat with Yuta. Utsumi is also the literal glue that holds this show's trio together at first, naming them the Gridman Alliance. He's a hardcore otaku through and through, but he's far from annoying. In fact, his genre knowledge and general passion and excitement keeps spirits high during battle. Soma Saito provides his voice and brings a level of realism to the character that's very welcome. He captures the vibe of a mostly put together, mostly well-liked weirdo who you wouldn't be surprised to hear making a video like this one. It's solid stuff. The final piece of the trio, and easily the most important, is Rika Takarada. Rika is at first a very aloof, disenchanted girl who values time spent with her actual friends as opposed to dedicating time to the so-called duties of the Gridman Alliance. But she quickly begins to show a warmer side, as she reflects on her own fears. Fears stemming from the idea of the people she cares for and the memories of them disappearing overnight. A subtly presented but deeply rooted fear of loneliness permeates all of her scenes. She clearly cares deeply for her closest friends and her mother, and it's her truly empathetic core that helps her soften up to Yuta and Utsumi eventually, making it clear that she truly does care for them. She's also familiar with Akane off the bat, the two being former friends who have grown distant over the last year according to Rika. This connection to Akane becomes a driving factor in both discovering the truth of SSSS Gridman's world, as well as playing directly into Akane's own character arc and the series' central message and themes. Rika is played by Yume Miyamoto who puts on what is quite possibly one of the most realistic performances I've ever heard in an anime. There's a breathy, casual believability to all of her delivery that makes her performance as this teenage girl extremely believable. Whether it be genuine sounding bizarre little noises, or just the soft tone she often speaks with, it's a legitimately fantastic performance that deserves a ton of praise. Aside from the Gridman Alliance, there's of course Gridman himself who's still very much the same character he was back in 93, right down to Hikaru Midorikawa reprising his role and bringing an identical cadence. He's still the titular hyperagent, the one who does the fighting, a shining beacon of what it means to be a hero. And SSSS further hones in on this by giving a greater focus to his actual character in the second act of the show, as well as some fascinating developments that help him feel a bit more fleshed out than he did in the original series. He truly reaches the peak of the title, The Hero of Dreams, by the time the series concludes, as his positive impact on Yuta, Rika, and Utsumi, as well as the hard impression he leaves on Akane, makes the character feel so much more complete than he did before, and essentially elevates Gridman into being one of the greatest fictional therapists of all time. SSSS Gridman also made the fairly inspired choice of giving human forms to four of his iconic support weapons, now hilariously calling themselves the Neon Genesis Junior High students. The Gridman Sword is now Samurai Caliber, a stuttering, wandering vagrant who carries himself with an unmatched swagger that only serves to contrast that this dude is a total bum. But what an iconic bum he is, occasionally dropping nuggets of real wisdom, almost serving as a sort of urban sage. Ryosuke Takahashi, no relation to the GOAT, provides his voice and does an excellent job playing this wandering, but emotionally intelligent weirdo with an endearing stutter. Joining him is the Twin Driller, now named Boar as a cute nod to Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad's Buster Boar name, a rambunctious little dickhead with a penchant for kicking Utsumi in the shin, and chewing out anyone who he thinks is slacking. He's voiced by one of my favorite VAs, Aoyuki, who you can tell is having a blast playing this annoying little wannabe mobster. The Thunder Jet is now named Vit, also a nod to Cyber Squad's Sky Vitter name. Vit unfortunately doesn't have much going for him, as he's mostly just a calm, smiling background character, with very little in the way of dialogue. He of course gets play in the battles themselves, but his actual personality can be summed up as the slight smile emoji. It's a shame because Masaya Matsukaze is a reasonably recognizable VA. He's just not given too much to work with here. Rounding out the support weapons is the God Tank, now going by the name Max, a nod to Cyber Squad's Tracto Max. Max is essentially the dad of this crew, attempting to offer advice to his fellow weapons as well as members of the Gridman Alliance. And even if most of that advice comes across as a bit useless, he's still quite charming. Katsuyuki Konishi provides his voice, and does a fine job playing the deep-voiced man's man. Despite very limited characterization for Vit, the support weapons bring a nice breath of fresh air to Gridman himself, 
as they assigned fun personalities to the previously inanimate weapons of the original series, bantering with the stoic hero himself on occasion. But the show's crowning achievement is its antagonist, Akane Shinjo. Akane is everything Takeshi was in the original amped up by a factor of five, but with the needed depth and exploration that Takeshi lacked for most of Denko Chojin, Akane is a soft-spoken, seemingly sweet girl who everybody loves. But she lives a double life, designing clay models of kaiju at home, all built to outright kill those who piss her off or inconvenience her, where Takeshi for the most part only seeks petty revenge. She plays up a slightly airheaded persona while out in public making clear attempts to befriend the Gridman Alliance, suspicious that they may be involved in the recent defeats of her kaiju. When the mask drops, she shows a cold, enraged side, not dealing with inconvenience as well, and lashing out all by herself while she's in her mess of an apartment. As the show moves forward, of course, more is revealed about her, and she outright becomes the show's central focus, taking over main character duties and becoming the vehicle for the show to explore its central theme, that being one of never giving up on reality. Even if the world can be a cruel, difficult place, there's always people out there to lend an ear to when you're in pain. Shutting yourself off from the world to bask in boring, but superficially comforting complacency can only really lead to sad emotional instability when things don't go your way. Sitting behind a screen all day, wearing a false mask, crafted to garner nothing but cheap adoration from others, can actively be detrimental and harmful to the real you. Never try to convince yourself that it's too late for someone to lend you an ear. In this crazy, inconsistent, and scary world, you can never truly be alone. Her arc is truly beautiful, and it's really where the show's heart is, with the entire cast and their own arc centering around her, as each of their personal journeys end up congregating in a mass attempt to figuratively and literally reach out to Akane. By the story's conclusion, she's gone from what seems like an irredeemable evil to a tragic, vulnerable character who had actively been harming herself through her own idealized false persona she had been wearing as a shield. It's a legitimately phenomenal, very complete character arc. And while it doesn't exactly bring anything new to the table, it's so refined, expertly planned out and executed, that I couldn't help but be impressed at how well the series pulled it off. Akane is absolutely the series' crowning jewel, and a knockout work of character writing by Hasegawa and Amamiya. It's just a slight shame that because the series is so focused and so centralized on her, in terms of both the flow of its story and its central theme, that the rest of the cast can at times feel a tad bit undercooked. But at the end of the day, as I already said, because of how well handled Akane's character arc is, some slightly weaker links don't impact the series too negatively. Akane is voiced by Reina Ueda, who communicates all of the characters' emotional peaks and plateaus beautifully, putting on a career-best performance that only serves to elevate the already excellent character. Complementing Akane's character is the villainous Alexis Carib. In terms of personality, on the surface he seems like a carbon copy of Khan Digifer, but there's genuinely a lot more to him. The way he interacts with Akane, egging on her worst habits, and providing manipulative health check-ins on her, shows his sick and twisted vision of caring for her. He masquerades as an ear for her to vent to, bringing her clay kaiju statues to life with his phrase, to wreak havoc on the city whenever she asks. His relationship with Akane is clearly a parasitic one, as at the end of the day it's clear that he's using her emotional instability to feed into his own mysterious machinations. It's a far slimier and much more manipulative dynamic than what Takeshi and Kondigifer had. Tetsu Inata plays the role with a smooth, diabolical twang that's just perfect, while exuding a devilish charisma. The series has one other central character, Anti, a kaiju created by Akane in a human image. He's built with the single purpose of killing Gridman. When he fails the skull initially, Akane lashes out, leaving him to wander the city streets alone. It's from here that his character arc becomes intertwined with Rika and Samurai Caliber, gaining a sense of self-actualization and becoming a central piece of the puzzle in Akane's rehabilitation. His journey is one of going from essentially a rejected pet to an independent individual who helps refocus the central antagonist's very view of life itself. Kenichi Suzumura sounds like a vicious, rabid dog in his performance as Auntie, which perfectly fits the rage he was created with the intent of dishing out. It's not just SSSS Gridman's cast that works in the show's favor, though. Its art direction, setting, and sound is quite special too. SSSS Gridman is set in the fictional Tokyo district of Susujidai, a quiet, primarily residential district away from the bustling city centers of Shinjuku and Shibuya. Susujidai is a stunningly well-realized setting, borrowing every landmark from real parts of Tokyo, but misplaced and mismatched in an odd way. It's a relaxing and even comforting location, but something about it always feels off. The show's camera often focuses on empty roads, railroads absent of trains, blades of grass, empty halls of Susujidai High School, and streets that feel more at home in a ghost town. It creates a mix of the comforting aura Sakura Gaoka had in the original show, with an undercurrent of something far more sinister. Many series would skip around the quiet moments and monotony of daily life, 
but the original Gridman was almost entirely about the wacky shenanigans happening in the small town, and SSSS Gridman carries that spirit forward, keeping a sharp focus on the city itself, contrasting the heat of the sun to the imposing silhouettes of Kaiju looming above. You can practically feel the summer heat burning down on the characters in nearly every episode. It's a very old-school approach to presenting the series' environment that feels more reminiscent of late 90s and early 2000s shows than anything from the late 2000s or 2010s giving it a unique feeling that some audience members may consider boring or far too relaxed for its own good. But to me, it does nothing but enhances the series. The show also packs in as many background details as it possibly can, from dozens of small knots to the original tokusatsu, that if I were to list one by one we would be here all day, to the lesbian couple from Mamamiya's own short story sitting in the background as Akane's friends. The series even goes as far as featuring Masaya Obi, not as Naoto, but just him, the actor, in the background of some scenes. That's just fantastic, and there's even some love for Trigger's own work. Akko from Little Witch Academia is one of the background classmates. And all of these references are so well integrated that it helps the series avoid ever feeling masturbatory. It's a testament to Amamiya's meticulous directing style that proved he was good at far more than just irreverent comedy shows. Realistic sound design complements this presentation too, with the hum of cars, the echoing school halls, and chirping birds giving a natural ambiance to every scene outside, with music used sparsely, giving both the audience and characters time to breathe. It's not until the kaiju battles of massive scale kick in that everything changes. The once calm city streets begin to tear apart under the weight and power of each kaiju, cars raining down from the sky as the city shakes from the clash of giants. With a booming score accompanying all of these extremely destructive battles that Gridman partakes in with these beasts, the soundtrack was composed by anime industry legend Shiro Sagasu, who achieves a perfect balance between heroic sweeping orchestral pieces, bizarre almost comedic sounding chiptune rhythms, as well as more somber reflective pieces. The entire soundtrack coming back to the central leitmotif of the track Human Love. It's a fantastic soundtrack that's used expertly across the show's run, complementing its emotional highs and lows. Rounding out the music is OXT's opening theme, Union, a triumphant opening that proudly explains the series' MO from the jump and recaptures the feeling of a Saturday morning super robot spectacle. Mayo Uchida's ending theme, Youthful Beautiful, becomes the perfect wind down from the insanity of the show's major clashes and mind blowing plot twists, accompanied by an equally beautiful credit sequence using real photographs as backgrounds. And on that note, it's not just the ending that visually stands out. SSSS Gridman is for the most part an exceptionally pretty show. The aforementioned presentation of the show's gorgeous environments is complemented by an equal amount of detail in a majority of the show's character interactions. Character design for the series was handled by Masaru Sakamoto, who brought a very unique look to the series' cast, SSSS Gridman generally having a soft, very rounded look for its characters, with some of the most impressive looking eyes you're likely to see in a modern anime, each character having a distinct pattern of their own, with many integrating a subtle textured spiral for an exceptionally impressive look. Eyes are an important part of the series, as much of the cast communicates and interacts with subtle, more believable motions, eyes shifting and mouth movements directly matching the voiceover, as realistic hand gestures and postures help keep the cast's interactions more grounded and believable. These believable motions and subtle details also play into the show's more expressive, explosive moments of animation that complement the series' far more frantic set pieces. Sakamoto was also instructed by Amamiya to base each of the characters' central color palettes and elements of their outfits off of the Decepticons and Autobots from the American Transformers comic series Shattered Glass because Amamiya is a mark for Takara toys and will let you know that at every opportunity he can, even getting his character designer in on it. Sakamoto's softer designs for the main cast contrast perfectly with his design for the support weapons and anti as well, who look far more typically quote-unquote studio trigger in their appearance. With pointed builds covered in edges so sharp you could cut wood with them, the show is also a master at subtle slapstick comedy. A majority of the humor in SSSS Gridman stems from believable, long pauses in between dialogue, humorous cuts, and exceptional background details. From Caliber falling flat on his ass multiple times because he can't fit his katanas through a door, to the cute little dynamic Bor and Utsumi have in relation to Bor constantly kicking the poor kid's shin. The jokes in SSSS Gridman are obviously not as common as the massive battles or character drama, but when they land, they absolutely earn their place. The best example of the series' visual strengths are featured in the phenomenal ninth episode, overseen by animator Kai Ikarashi, an absolute home run of an episode that serves as a kickoff to the series' conclusion, and a full dive into Akane's character. Another powerful standout of the visuals is the excellent mechanical and kaiju work, as well as the series' action sequences. Mechanical design in SSSS Gridman was handled by a team of longtime veterans and excellent up-and-comers of the craft, coming together to create a widely varied and fantastic set of machines and monsters. Gridman got his fantastic modernized redesign, referred to as Primal Gridman, from Masayuki Goto, a mainstay designer for Tsuburaya's more recent Ultra series. He managed to create a refreshing new look for Gridman that doesn't abandon the traits that made the original Akamatsu design so memorable, exchanging much of the exposed bodysuit for a sharp, very metallic set of armor that helps Gridman take on a far sturdier, yet still recognizable appearance. 
His design is fittingly more reminiscent of a contemporary piece of high-end consumer electronics, decorated in fancy but not too eye-searing LEDs, with an ever so slightly slimmer build that makes the hero look a bit more on the nimble side. Though some previous elements of Gridman's design, such as the vents on his chest piece, have been sealed off, creating a more compact design all around. The support weapons were all redesigned by another longtime Takara designer, Tsuyoshi Nonaka, who took his distinct, chunky, and very toyetic designs and adapted them to match with the slick, contemporary approach Goto took with designing Gridman. And when you mix these designs together for all the combinations or support forms, you get some very gaudy, even outright silly looking designs that harken back to the over-the-top upgraded forms from the original Tokusatsu perfectly. With the new combo forms, Max Gridman, Buster Gridman, Sky Gridman, and Full Powered Gridman all looking like the most absurd yet desirable robot toys you can get nowadays. Gridman's action animation and 2D sequences were overseen by Hiroki Mudoguchi, who made sure that the series 2D battles were as reminiscent of classic super robot anime as possible, with key focus in the 2D sequences being put on high-octane, fast-paced movements that called back to the classic robot shows of the 80s and 90s, particularly the work of the legendary Masami Obari. In fact, some of these visual references go so far that they get dangerously close to going from flattery to potential plagiarism, which actually got Obari himself to come out and ask Studio Trigger to just call him next time, eventually leading to Obari designing the illustrations on the toy boxes for SSSS Gridman figures. While the 2D action scenes of the series leaned far harder towards Super Robot than Tokusatsu, the show features some of the best, directly Tokusatsu-inspired CGI battles that the anime industry has ever seen, thanks to Studio Graphinica. Graphinica worked directly with Amamiya and Trigger to create perfect one-to-one -one CG recreations of Goto and Onaka's designs. I've never been particularly bothered by CGI mecha. Robots are exceptionally difficult to keep at a steady level of detail in 2D animation, but even I have to admit that the work Graphinica did on SSSS Gridman is a cut above the rest. Extra care was put into making sure all of Gridman's movements closely represented those from the original show, from the way he swings punches to how he grapples and wrestles with the kaiju he fights. Micro details such as slightly jiggly shoulder pads were also honed in on to make these 3D models feel more like actual costumes. The environment breaking off into chunky blocks also helped sell the destruction of these CG fights as feeling like you're watching a foam set get torn down, and it works exceptionally well. Graphinica absolutely nailed the CG sequences which do, in fact, make up a bulk of the fights in the show. And I have no problem with this, as again, these CG scenes are killer. Though if there was one thing I had to complain about, it's that at times the lighting on the actual models is rather flat, and doesn't always match up with the environments themselves, which can get distracting, especially in some of the larger scale battles later in the show's run. A majority of the kaiju designs throughout the series were also rendered in immense detail by Graphinica, and designed by a who's who of Japanese media vets, Hiroshi Maruyama, Ichiro Itano, Mahiro Maeda, Osamu Yamaguchi, and Shinji Nishikawa all contributed to the kaiju's designs in the show, giving the monster lineup a level of variety that you couldn't get anywhere else, even slipping in wonderful details such as Auntie's kaiju design being a slight send-up to Shinoblar from the original show, with the fantastic soundtrack, a solid cast of characters, top-notch directing, great 2D action, and top-of-the-line 3D CG, as well as pouring on more love for the original show than you could ever get anywhere else. SSSS Gridman was already on track to be a damn fun show, and a loving tribute to the original series. But as I stated earlier, it's the character of Akane Shinjo and the series' central themes that turn the series from a good show to a legitimately excellent one. It truly is a special watch, a series that aggressively rejects nihilism, and forces its lead character to confront the everyday struggles that each and every one of us faces, all while elevating Gridman as a series itself. SSSS Gridman is a fantastic show that only gets better on rewatch. The series is licensed in America and Europe by Funimation, who released a very bare bones, but serviceable Blu-ray for the series. The show can also be viewed on many streaming sites such as Crunchyroll. It also received a passable dub from Funimation. I highly recommend SSSS Gridman. While it has its own pocket of issues, its central theme, and in particular its antagonist, make it more than a worthwhile watch. It's a fantastic series that I won't be forgetting anytime soon. SSSS Gridman was a massive success for Super Eye Productions and Studio Trigger, becoming one of the most talked about anime of 2018 in Japan and performing well in both ratings as well as its Blu-ray sales, where it pulled in over 8k units per volume, which at the time was certainly above the usual for Blu-ray sales. This was partially thanks to a series of audio dramas written by Amamiya himself, released alongside each episode, that showed the series characters in continued everyday situations with each volume of the Blu-ray coming with a special radio drama set after key events in the show. The series was eventually awarded the 58th Japanese Science Fiction Convention's Award for Best Original Sci-Fi Animation, and continued to garner plenty of fan art, tie-in merchandise, and most importantly, appreciation for its central message. 
which resonated deeply with its teen to young adult viewership. It also helped fully reignite people's appreciation for the original tokusatsu, giving it a huge bump in retroactive rewatches, and eventually leading to an international Blu-ray release of the series. While SSSS Gridman was loved by those who watched it outside of Japan, it didn't make too much of an international splash. But to Tsuburaya and Trigger, that didn't really matter. Trigger had other series its international viewership ate up and Super Eye was more than happy to have Gridman back in the public spotlight with such a positive reception. And it was only a matter of time before they cashed in on this new wave of success. Super Eye had a resurrected cash cow now, and they were gonna milk the hell out of it. Gridman would receive a full intellectual property relaunch, under the title of the Gridman Universe, a full collection of side stories meant to cash in on the newfound success of the Reborn franchise. And between 2019 and 2022, a metric ton of side material was released. Now, there's a lot of this, some of which was released right after SSSS Gridman, and some of it which released after the 2021 sequel series, Dina Xenon. So I'm going to use this segment to quickly go over all the spin-offs, and what they bring to the table. I also need to preface this segment by saying that none of these are going to receive official English translations, ever. The only two entries in this segment that have received translations were done by fans. Gridman is just not popular enough a franchise to justify bringing any of these over. Also, it's been some years since most of them have released, so the train has long since left the station. The only way to officially get these is to do what I did, and purchase them physically or digitally through websites like Yahoo eBooks Japan or Rakuten. That said, the coverage of each of these is going to be brief, as many of these runs were rather short, and more of a way for Tsuburaya to continue cashing in on the newfound popularity of the series, as opposed to fully expanding on the themes and world that Hisagawa, Amamiya, and the rest of Studio Trigger had built. The first of these was a series of two light novels, called SSSS Gridman Novelization, written by Yume Mizusawa, with illustrations by popular web artist Bun150. Volume 1 was released in September of 2019, and Volume 2 was released in February of 2020. Novelization isn't actually what it says on the tin. It's not a one-to-one -one novelized adaptation of the show. In fact, it's an entirely original story set between episodes 8 and 9 of SSSS Gridman that goes completely off the rails and totally in its own direction, ending up being totally at odds with the story of the original anime. The novelization focuses on a brand new character, a girl physically identical to Akane, just with black hair, whose name, I kid you not, is Akane Black. Tony Shinju is the true god. Black! As she weasels her way into the Gridman Alliance's lives, causing a series of increasingly chaotic happenings to occur. The story feels like fun, clown shoes nonsense in its best moments, and at odds with the anime's central themes at its lowest. The highlight of this light novel series being the solid artwork by Bun150, and the interesting yet gimmicky chapter structure the light novel uses, with chapters being split between main acts and essentially side events. Are these books worth reading? Honestly, while Bun's artwork is great, and seeing more of this cast has its own appeal, it's dubious compatibility with the anime itself makes it more of an interesting side note than anything else. Following this, in October of 2019, SSSS Gridman, Neon Genesis Junior High Student's Diary would begin its 20-chapter run in Monthly Comics Alive, a short slice-of-life manga focused on everyday shopping trips, silly scenarios, and general off-days that the support weapons have outside of the main events of the series. It's a cute, if brief way of exploring more support unit shenanigans, cashing in on just how popular these four became. The artwork from Mangeka Ariko is also simple but charming, fitting the mood of this more casual, down-to-earth side story. Unfortunately, if you're not particularly a big fan of slice of life storytelling, then this manga isn't for you, as it's entirely focused on that aspect of Gridman as a franchise. Starting the exact same day in October of 2019, also in Monthly Comic Alive, was Kei Toru's manga, SSSS Gridman, Princess and Samurai. Princess and Samurai follows a young girl named Kudzuki Hime, a complete airhead and social disaster, who's looking to fix her social life and gain some friends. While on her way to school one morning, Hime comes across Samurai Caliber, who seems to have completely lost his memories. All that he does know is that there's a strange infection going around Susujidai, one that's transforming emotionally unstable residents into kaiju. To combat these kaiju, Samurai Caliber equips Hime with a special item, the Barrier Gear, a play on Gridman's Barrier Shield from the original Tokusatsu series. Equipping the Barrier Gear puts Hime into a suit of mechanized magical girl armor, allowing her to go head-to-head -head against these kaiju. From here, the two come across a young loner named Akane, and set off to find the source of what's causing all these odd happenings around town. Princess and Samurai is alright. Its strongest element is Toru's character artwork easily. It's expressive, pleasant looking, and does a decent enough job emulating Sakamoto's art style from the anime. Toru also does solid work illustrating digestible, if slightly plain feeling fight sequences. The manga also has some legitimately excellent comedic moments, with a really charming dynamic forming between Hime and Samurai Caliber, in a father and adopted daughter sort of relationship. Toru's artwork is solid all around, and makes the manga a pretty pleasant, easy-to-digest read, though it still has its fair share of issues. And by far the element I'm the most torn on in Princess and Samurai is its narrative. Without directly spoiling anything that happens in the manga, 
it definitely goes in a direction I wasn't expecting, and much like the novelizations, ends up stumbling into a place that feels completely incompatible with the original anime, at least on a strictly story level. Thematically, it does have a decent bit in common with SSSS Gridman, tackling the topics of isolation and loneliness from a somewhat similar angle. Though the story's events become too needlessly convoluted for their own good. And by the manga's conclusion I was left wondering what the point of it all was. The manga was a decent enough way of adapting Gridman's barrier shield from the original Tokusatsu, one of the few items that didn't make it into SSSS Gridman, but aside from that, Princess and Samurai is an odd, if slightly endearing, entry in the franchise. And at three volumes, despite some of my issues with its narrative, it doesn't exactly waste your time and overstay its welcome. Following Princess and Samurai, in late November of 2019, on the Shonen Jump Plus website, mangaka Yuki Kono would begin their manga adaptation of the SSSS Gridman anime, simply titled SSSS Gridman. This would be a very direct six-volume adaptation of the anime, with little in the way of changes, and SSSS Gridman without the audio and visual strengths of the original anime, along with losing Amamiya's excellent directing, is a much flatter feeling experience unfortunately. Though Kono's artwork is charming, this is no replacement for the show itself. One thing that it does have going for it is that it adapted some of Amamiya's audio dramas into mini bonus chapters, so I'd at least recommend trying to seek those out. The next batch of Gridman Universe side material would be slated for May of 2020. This round would consist of one light novel, two manga, and a stage play adaptation of SSSS Gridman focusing on the support weapons, set to be directed by theater director Fumiya Matsuzaki, and it would be accompanied with a new opening theme by OXT, fittingly titled Reunion. Unfortunately, due to far more pressing world events that would unravel in early 2020, the stage play would be cancelled, with the only remnants of it ever releasing being the initial teaser poster and OXT's theme song. The two manga, as well as the new light novel, would still manage to make their May 2020 launch without a hitch. The first would be another slice of life manga, Neon Genesis Junior High Students Butler Cafe, a manga illustrated and written by Masaki Sano that would see its magazine run occur in Monthly Shonen Champion. Butler Cafe, much like Diaries before it, further cashing in on the newfound popularity of the support weapons, as well as throwing Rika and Akane in the mix, for some cute and humorous but ultimately unsubstantial shoujo fun. The more noteworthy of these two manga, releasing at the exact same time also running in Monthly Shonen Champion, would be Sengoku Gridman, written by Yuki Tamura. Sengoku Gridman follows a young boy named Iboshi, living in an alternate history version of the Sengoku period, full of prosthetic limbs, steam-powered machinery, and wooden mecha. Iboshi's home, Kurama Village, is one of the last remaining strongholds in a plague ridden Japan, a plague that transforms those who are infected by it into kaiju. On one fateful day, Iboshi's younger sister, Tamaki, falls ill with early symptoms of the plague, and after teaming up with the village chief and doctor, Kurama, Iboshi is nearly killed by a kaiju, though he's miraculously saved by a seemingly magic lake. A lake seemingly containing a being known as Gridman, who equips him with the Rising Acceptor, transforming Iboshi into Sengoku Gridman. And after the arrival of a seemingly plague-infected samurai caliber, Iboshi and his newfound crew set off in an attempt to find a cure for Tamaki's illness and perhaps end this plague once and for all. Sengoku Gridman is the unfortunate case of a very cool idea not being given enough time to flesh itself out. The conclusion to plot points such as Tamaki's infection, Iboshi's overall character arc, and the source of the plague itself ends up being somewhat disappointing. And while its twists and turns didn't exactly surprise me, this being a Gridman story after all, I was still a tad let down by the eventual plot revelations. The character who I overall feel has the most complete arc out of its three volumes, is the village chief and medic, Kurama. And while her character can basically be summed up as biking at home, it's still biking at home, which means she's generally really cool. But the absolute highlight of the series, and the reason I feel it's worth checking out, is Yuki Tamura's excellent artwork. With dagger-sharp character designs, expressive character faces that communicate a wide range of emotion, and a level of visceral violence and brutality that's pretty much exclusive to this entry of the Gridman franchise, Sengoku Gridman has a really unique look for itself. This blended with the more Oni-inspired look of its kaiju, and the crimson, incredible-looking Shogun armor-inspired Sengoku Gridman itself helps this stand out as easily the best-looking of the manga spin-offs. And even if its final volume left me a tad on the disappointed side, I highly recommend giving the series at least a look, just for Tamara's artwork. It's unfortunate, but the weakest elements of this series are the Gridman elements themselves. One day I hope Yuki Tamara gets a chance to write another historical fantasy manga, this time not held back by the rules of a series that's entire initial pitch and core concept doesn't really mesh with the time period it's set in, unless some serious legwork is done to make it work, which Sengoku Gridman unfortunately just didn't have the time to do. The final of the 2020 spin-offs was the light novel, SSSS Gridman, Another Load, 
Written by the very young recent Ultraman franchise screenwriter Aya Satsuki, and featuring illustrations by the artist Oremo, Another Load, aside from its unfortunate sounding title in English, is genuinely a pretty fun one volume romp. Another Load follows a young girl named Nagisa, a high school girl who secretly works part time as an idol named Umi. When coming home from an exhausting gig one day, she sees that the support weapon Vit is crashing in her apartment. From here, the two end up becoming an unlikely pair of roommates. And meanwhile, while all of that is going on, Bor has somehow found his goofy ass transported into an isekai, where he ends up becoming the king of the land of demons, working closely with their moody prince, Asaf. Another load follows these two stories in parallel, switching every two chapters between each one. And somehow, with a premise as ridiculous as this, Satsuki found a way to get the story to work. Vit and Nagisa, and Bor and Asaf, both have really fun dynamics. And the way this story wraps itself up and ties into the greater Gridman universe is genuinely pretty heartwarming. Aya Satsuki actually managed to get a fun story out of this ridiculous premise. And honestly, more power to her for it. On top of that, Vid is more of a character here than he ever was in the actual show, with the light novel establishing his relaxed nature and kindness as his strongest traits, as he develops a very charming dynamic with Nagisa, helping the young girl through some of her emotional turmoil. Urimo's illustrations also complement all the events of the story perfectly, with some genuinely solid approximations of the mecha design from the main series. Another Load is a surprisingly fun light novel that further expands on two of the support weapons and introduces some fun new characters of its own. But it's not my favorite because the final batch of Gridman spin-offs would release a year later in April 2021, though this time it would only be two pieces of side material, as they would happen to coincide with a far more important entry into the Gridman franchise. The first of these two spin-offs was the web novel, Diclone vs. Gridman. Diclone being one of Takara's longest running toy lines. Diclone vs. Gridman would be penned by longtime Brave series writer, Hiroaki Kitajima, and it would feature illustrations by Masaru Sakamoto himself. Diclone vs. Gridman is short, releasing as four very brisk micro-chapters on Takara's website. Diclone vs. Gridman follows the Diclone officer, Hikari Kazaki, as she finds herself becoming Gridman's new human host, where through a series of wild events, the two have to defeat a warder monster attacking the Earth. Warders being monsters from the Diclone series. Diclone is interesting as it's a toy line that's always been story driven, those stories coming in pamphlets within the boxes of Diclone toys. But due to the broad appeal of Gridman, Diclone vs. Gridman's story was instead posted online, to coincide with the release of the Diclone Gridman toy line. This project wasn't the most typical of side stories, but more of an awesome throwback collaboration between the original toy line that helped create Gridman in the first place, and the new Studio Trigger Helm Resurrection. But out of the two spin-offs released in April of 2021, the far more noteworthy of the two was the manga Gridman Dogma. Gridman Dogma, written and illustrated by Hazumu Suzuka, would see its three-volume run hosted in Karage Bunch magazine. Dogma follows three new support units, Vice, Mari, and Bane, as the three of them are brought together by a mysterious young girl named Chloe, Chloe having the special ability to transform into her own version of Gridman. The story follows the repeated structure of Chloe going to a different computer world, each world containing one of the support units, who joins her as a sort of party member. Gridman Dogma's unique gimmick to keep readers hooked runs off the idea of all of these support units, and Chloe herself, being strange, perverted, even psychotic bastard children of sorts. Gridman Dogma's central theme is one of neglect, and how communities and circles can form from the outliers of society. All four of Gridman Dogma's central characters are completely unhinged. Gridman Dogma is one of the most fascinating entries in the entire franchise, and despite its at times comically edgy nature, the story takes some genuinely surprising twists and turns that somehow finds a way to comfortably tie itself into overall Gridman canon, making more of a direct connection to the original tokusatsu than any of the other side material from the Gridman universe aside from the trigger shows. If there's one major caveat I have with Gridman Dogma, it's that Hazumu Suzuka is a painter by trade, and not a manga artist. In fact, Dogma was his first and so far only manga. This leads to Dogma not being what anyone would traditionally consider good looking. The art style is rough, with very loose line work, inconsistent proportions, and at times hard to parse backgrounds. But where Sasuke slightly makes up for this is in his mechanical designs, with Chloe's Gridman form, as well as all of the support weapons transformed forms, looking reasonably passable for the most part. I think I'm generally pretty generous to Gridman Dogma. Reason for that being again, it's Sasuke's first manga, and that it actually puts in the work to try and connect itself to the greater Gridman canon, and its abrasive, more edgy nature makes it a distinct feather in the franchise's cap, even if it's certainly a rough one, much like its characters. And that's all of the Gridman side material. It's pretty crazy that Tsuburaya commissioned this much work within the span of just four years. The studio was riding the Gridman train high, but they knew that short spin-offs like this wouldn't cut it for the long run. Something more substantial was needed to make the Gridman universe feel like an actual universe. 
but with Akane Shinjo's story complete and wrapped up in a neat little bow, a direct continuation seemed somewhat unlikely. But money talks, and Tsuburaya would eventually come knocking on Akira Amamiya's door once again. And the resulting collaboration between Tsuburaya Productions and Trigger this time would not just be the best entry in the entire Gridman franchise, but easily my favorite anime of the last decade. With the success of SSSS Gridman, a sequel of some sort was an inevitability, Tsuburaya's appetite not satiated by just the spin-off entries. Though this was a tricky situation for Akira Amamiya and his team at Studio Trigger, SSSS Gridman was the story of Akane Shinjo, and that story was complete, with a very satisfactory, explicitly final ending. It took some coercing from Tsuburaya Productions, but eventually Amamiya would agree to direct a sequel series. The only thing that was leaving him hesitant was that he was unsure of what elements from the original Gridman could still be covered. It was then that he thought back to a conversation he had with Gridman's voice actor Hikaru Midorikawa as production of SSS Gridman was wrapping up. Midorikawa had mentioned to him that he was disappointed in the lack of Dyna Dragon in the show, and told Amamiya that if they ever did the sequel, it should be focused on Dyna Dragon. Recalling this conversation would set the gears in motion in Amamiya's head, and he would quickly begin drafting the ideas for this new Gridman anime. He settled on the base concept of a combining robot show, centering on a team of pilots controlling the Dyna Dragon. And while this idea had very little in common with the Dyna Dragon from the original Tokusatsu, Amamiya believed that it would be a better call to leave plenty of legroom for what the details of the story could entail. Wanting his team to have even more creative freedom this time around, Keiichi Hasegawa would once again agree to return to script the series and help Amamiya plan out its central narrative. And soon after, nearly the entire staff of SSS Gridman would come with him. This new project had already become a full-on staff reunion, with Grafinica agreeing to return and handle the series CG. And to bolster the series' production strength further, Yostar Pictures, who had assisted on the 2D animation on certain episodes of SSSS Gridman, would also be brought back in a more significant role for outsourcing. With with the returning team back together, they took what they had learned from their experiences working on SSSS Gridman, and pulled through with one of the smoothest, most effective production schedules in the recent history of anime, with Akira Amamiya himself stating in a 2021 interview with the Japanese website Anime Hack, all of the staff members have grown even more since last time, and their quality work meant that I had a fairly easy time as director. I felt at the time that I had done a good job for my first time for SSSS Gridman, but SSSS Dyna Xenon went even more smoothly. There were many experienced people on the staff who had built up knowledge from the last time, and those who were new this time around delivered quality work as well. For me, it was a positive experience all throughout, and I really enjoyed my time working on it. I feel blessed in my work. And on April 2nd, 2021, once again on Tokyo MX, SSSS Dyna Xenon would make its television debut. Yomogi Asanaga is a fairly average high school student, splitting his focus between classes in the morning and his night shift working stock at a market as his job, keeping busy day to day to take his mind off the stress of his fairly normal but somewhat turbulent home life, with his mom soon to remarry to a man he's not sure how to feel about. This daily grind hits a road bump when he comes across a strange man claiming to be a 5,000 year old warrior who can summon kaiju. In his own words, a kaiju user named Gauma who claims that Kaiju could start attacking the city at any moment. Ignoring the seemingly rambling lunatic's words, Yamogi tries to go on with his life normally, though a wrench is quickly thrown in this plan too, when one of his classmates, Yume Minami, asks him out on a date, Yume having a bit of a reputation for asking out random boys and standing them up for seemingly no reason. Taking her up on it, out of a slight curiosity about her behavior, Yomogi and Yume end up finding themselves in the same spot where Gauma is, a spot where a surprise Kaiju attack occurs. It's here that Gauma summons a giant robot, a machine known as Dyna Xenon, a combining mech made from four vehicles, each which has to be piloted for the machine to operate at full capacity. The Dyna Soldier, the Dyna Wing, the Dyna Striker, and the Dyna Diver. Gauma quickly forces Yomogi into the Dyna Soldier's cockpit and Yume into the Dyna Wing, while Gauma himself pilots the Dyna Diver. And unfortunately for him, another man, Koyomi Yamanaka, and his young cousin Chise happen to be walking along the road where Dyna Zenon appears, with Gauma scooping up Kiyomi and forcing him into the Dyna Striker. With the machine now having its four necessary pilots, the kaiju is quickly demolished. With the three regular civilians still reeling from the insane experience they just had, the cause of the kaiju attacks quickly reveals itself. Gauma's old crew from 5,000 years ago, a group of kaiju users known as the Kaiju Eugenicists, 
From here, it becomes a race against the clock for Gaoma to turn Yomogi, Yume, and Koyomi into an expert team of pilots and defeat his former allies before they summon enough kaiju to destroy the entirety of the city. And that is the most basic, spoiler-free summary of Dina Zenon I can give. Because it quickly becomes clear that this fairly standard setup is Keiichi Hasegawa's brilliant platform to explore some of the best character writing and thematic storytelling in a modern anime, using its simplistic setup to tell one of the best ensemble mecha stories in recent years. With an exceptionally fleshed out, well-rounded cast, even stronger directing than the first show from Mamma Mia, and absolutely stunning visuals, all wrapped up in a tight, 12-episode package that delves into some even darker topics than SSSS Gridman did, all while building off of the themes of that series. Where Gridman was the story of Akane and her road to recovery, Dina Zenon is the tale of five very flawed people, finding solace in each other and starting new chapters in their lives. Brought together by a 5,000-year-old maniac and his giant robot, the series tackles the themes of depression, regret, uncertainty, failure, self-harm, grief, and learning to cope with all of those unstable, inconsistent emotions, by way of not just self-improvement, but through the love of those around you. Themes that complement and overlap with SSSS Gridman, just with its focus spread out on a far wider cast of characters, as opposed to one central character. Dina Zenon is the beautiful tale of aimless, hurt people becoming everyday superheroes in their own right. It takes the central concept of the original Gridman Tokusatsu, an idea that anyone can be a hero, and builds on those concepts for a more mature audience. This series has a heart of gold and a legitimately beautiful message. It reassures you that regardless of how grim life can seem at times, there's always something beautiful and new around the bend. Humans aren't perfect, we never can be and that imperfection is part of what makes us great and life beautiful. And the series achieves this through one of the best casts of characters in recent memory. Yomogi Asanaga is seemingly the most quote-unquote plain protagonist you can have in a story such as this. A fairly popular student in his school with a good friend circle, decent grades, and a solid work ethic for his age. But there's something he clearly feels he's missing in his life. Everything about his life is very standard, going through the motions, and he seems somewhat content with that. Though between his uncertain feelings about his mother's current boyfriend, and and general uncertainty about what to do once high school ends, it's easy to tell that Yomogi is content, but lost. And it's not until the human hurricane that is Gauma shows up in his life that things begin to progress down a bizarre, but very necessary path for his growth. Yomogi at first rejects his responsibilities as the pilot of the Dina Soldier, claiming that he's perfectly happy with his regular high school life, and choosing to go work at his night shift at the market as opposed to showing up for Gauma's Dina Zenon pilot training regimen. This weird kaiju fighting superhero lifestyle that's been thrust upon him is at first a bit too overwhelming for the poor kid, but it's through his relationships with Yume and Gauma that he begins to legitimately care. And in in many ways becomes the group's true de facto leader and its heart. As the story progresses, Gaoma becomes somewhat of an older brother figure to Yomogi. Being without a father and being unsure of his mother's current boyfriend, in an odd turn of events, Gaoma becomes the male role model in his life. With the man's abrasive nature and over-the-top bravado, forcing Yomogi into uncomfortable situations that he has to learn to adapt to and face head-on. His once plain, directionless life becoming one of active adventure and self-discovery. This goes beyond Gaoma as well, because Yomogi's main driving factor behind putting himself out there ends up coming from Yume. It's his curiosity over her odd behavior asking random boys out and standing them up, as well as staying generally reclusive, that piques his curiosity and gets his story directly intertwined with hers. Yomogi gets to see a very different side to Yume than anyone else. Realizing that she clearly suffers from heavy grief and depression, he begins to legitimately care for her as a friend, trailing behind her and becoming a key figure in her own personal journey. And with a little added wingmanning and life advice provided by Gaoma, Yomogi begins to develop legitimate romantic feelings for her. Seeing this new friend who he now deeply cares for in pain, and the troubles that the rest of the Dinazen on crew goes through, causes Yomogi to reflect on how easy he has it in comparison, stirring emotions in him he never thought he'd feel, and molding him into someone who's ready to fight for what he believes in. Seeing Yomogi mature over the course of the show's 12 episodes is a beautiful thing, as he slowly morphs from complacent and aimless into a selfless, legitimately heroic figure who's willing to push himself to new extremes for the people he loves and developing a new, far more humanitarian lease on life, all brought about by the connections he grows to the other members of the Dina Zenon crew, becoming both an amazing, consistent pilot, and a brave, proud young man in his own right, as he begins to grow a deep appreciation and love for the little things in life, whether it be through Gaoma's untraditional teaching methods, or the love and adoration he begins to feel towards Yume. Yomogi is honestly the complete package for a protagonist of a short mecha series like this, the character himself evolving and transforming along with the robot, and learning to truly uplift and appreciate those around him, as well as admiring the little flaws and imperfections that humans have. Yomogi becomes a full-on Chad by the series' conclusion. His journey is an empathetic one, and one that I believe truly resonates with a lot of teenagers and young adults who watch the show. Junya Inoki provides his voice, and puts on an excellent but somewhat subdued performance. 
selling his growth from an initially unsure teenager to someone who's truly found his place and a newfound love for the world around him. He also nails the slang and vocal quirks of a contemporary high schooler. Yume Minami is one of Yomugi's classmates, and a general social outcast within their school. Somewhat ostracized by most of her peers, she's generally seen as one of the quote-unquote weird girls. She can always be seen fidgeting around or playing with an onk puzzle she always carries with her, though her generally reserved, quiet nature shuts most people out. It's not until she gets wrapped up in Galma's kaiju hunting nonsense that her life begins to take a turn and more is revealed about her. Without much for her to do outside of school, she ends up always being on time to Galma's training sessions, quickly becoming quite a decent pilot of the Dino Wing, and generally a strong member of the Dino Zenon crew. The problem is, she gets absolutely nothing out of this. Piloting this giant robot renders little response from her. Much like Yomogi, she seems to be cruising through life with no purpose, but for very different reasons. It turns out that Yume is shackled by crippling grief and depression over the death of her sister, Kano, who passed away when she was a little girl. Dying of a fall that Yume never truly learned the circumstances behind, her parents playing coy about it. It doesn't help the fact that most of her memories of Kano are that of her last few years of life where she was very distant from Yume, in her mind practically ignoring her. She never got any sense of closure with her sister, and all she has to really remember her positively by is an onk puzzle she used to play with, the very same one that Yume constantly carries around with her now. But after getting involved with the Dinazen on team, and actually getting to know Yomagi as a person, it becomes clear to her that he can see how unwell she is, leading to her opening up to him. It's here that the two set off on a journey to meet and interact with as many of Kano's former classmates as possible, to try and piece together the circumstances around her death and what the cause may have been, with Yume desperately hoping that this can give her a sense of closure. Unfortunately, the various stories her and Yomogi hear about only serve to deepen Yume's grief. It doesn't help that some of the only video of Kano that still exists from when she was alive and in high school is a collection of voyeuristic, gross, and slightly exploitative YouTube prank videos. The kind that were all over the website in 2014, Yume's frustration and pain continues to grow, nearly forcing her down a spiral that she can't come back from, but it's through the legitimate care that Yomogi shows for her, as well as the motivation brought along by fighting Kaiju in the Dino Zenon team, that pushes her to confront her grief head on, leading to moments where she finds legitimate joy in life again, and eventually being the one to take initiative towards developing a romantic relationship with Yomogi. Yume's story is one of learning to deal with grief, and accepting the help of those who reach out to you in your darkest moments. A somewhat similar arc to Akane's in SSSS Gridman, but even more intimate, small-scale, and personal feeling. And the exact scene where her character arc truly crescendos, and closes off beautifully, marking a new chapter in her life, is one of the rare instances where an anime has gotten me to tear up. Seeing this pained young girl go on a journey of learning to accept the memories of loved ones, both positive and negative, and learning to accept new love into her life is legitimately very moving, and it helps that the budding romance between her and Yomogi is convincing, well-paced, and avoids feeling forced at all. The two directly uplifting each other, and starting to build the bridge towards a new, far more beautiful future together. Without Yume, Yomogi's character arc wouldn't work, and without Yomogi, Yume's character arc wouldn't work. The two complement each other as an almost dual protagonist pair. Yume is voiced by Shion Wakayama, who captures an air of sadness and frustration in much of her delivery, highlighting the turmoil and depression that Yume is going through, and bringing out a soft joy and playfulness as Yume begins to recover. It's an excellent performance befitting of an excellent character. Koyomi Yamanaka is a very different character than Yomogi and Yume. He's a man in his late 20s, still living at home with no job, no aspirations, and no passions. He doesn't take care of himself particularly well, and he doesn't see himself with having much of a future. In fact, it almost seems like he's given up, sitting in his room and playing video games all day or just staying in bed. No motivation to get himself out. The only person keeping him company or motivating him to do anything is his younger cousin, Chise. In fact, the whole reason he ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time and gets involved with the Dinosaur on crew is because Chise wanted to go out for a walk with him. Being part of a team that pilots a giant robot and battles kaiju doesn't motivate him initially either. It's still Chise who pushes him and tags along with him at Galma's training sessions. And eventually, the time that he's forced to spend with the rest of the Dinos and on crew is where Koyomi begins to reflect on himself, having some legitimately meaningful conversations with Galma about motivation and purpose. And through happenstance, he ends up reconnecting with an old flame of his, Inamoto, who happens to also be Yomogi's boss. Unfortunately for Koyomi, his relationship with her is where the source of his initial regret stems, with this reconnection causing his mind to linger again on his past regrets and personal sense of failure. And it is that regret that shackles Koyomi down and keeps him in the unmotivated, sad, defeated state that he's in. His constant longing for what could have been prevents him from ever moving forward, and it's caused him to flounder in life. This even comes close to swaying him towards committing actions that would be needlessly petty and cruel, and only suffocate him with a fervent sense of regret and guilt. Thankfully, it's through his conversations with Galma, seeing Yume and Yomogi, two young high schoolers building a path forward for themselves, Chise always being there to cheer him on regardless of the mistakes he makes, and a circumstantial encounter he has with one of the kaiju eugenicists, Mujina, 
that he finally begins to see that it's not worth giving up on himself, and that it's never too late to try and find a direction in life. Just because you're in your late 20s, hell, if you're as old as 40, and you feel like you've hit the end of the road, constantly making mistakes or just appearing to be a bad person in general, there's always a chance for recovery and redemption somewhere out there. Sometimes you have to actively seek it out, and if you have a good enough support circle, it may even just come directly to you instead. Koyomi feels like Heisagawa's way of communicating to many of the young adult men watching that they should actively appreciate themselves and stop lingering on past regrets. That if you accept the hands of those who reach out to help you and treat them with equal appreciation, you'll be fine. I know for a fact that Koyomi is an extremely relatable character for a lot of young men. With his story being particularly resonant with the socially isolated era we're in now, it's worth taking in the words that Hasegawa shares through this character. Don't give up, because there's always another chance right around the corner. You just might not see it yet. Koyomi is voiced by Yuichiro Umehara, who captures the energy of the directionless, somewhat lonely 20-something with ease, whether that's during the exciting kaiju battles, or during the series' later moments of introspection. Standing right beside Koyomi and having an excellent character arc of her own is his young cousin, Chisei Asukagawa. Much like her older cousin, but at a far earlier stage in her life, Chisei is floundering. Having practically dropped out of middle school, she gets more excitement out of just playing video games or watching Dinazen on fight than she ever did spending any time in class. But all of this cheap excitement feels like a smokescreen for something else. What Chisei longs for is a sense of acceptance. She's a very socially isolated person, clinging onto her cousin as her one and only friend. That is, until she meets the rest of the Dinazen on crew, who she quickly latches onto, being the most motivated member of the group next to Galma, despite not actually piloting the machine at all. For some time, she's essentially relegated to the role of Dinazen on cheerleader, which eventually begins to get to her. Feeling as if her cousin's duties to Dinazenon are beginning to pull him away from her, and never truly feeling like part of the group despite being one of the most passionate members. If there's one thing carrying her through any of these lows, it's her hyperactive nature and great sense of humor, which helps her cling to hope in some of her lower moments. But over the events of the series, through the positive relationships she forms with the rest of the Dinazenon crew, and some absolutely wild, gridman as hell circumstances, she comfortably finds her place and learns to tackle the world head on once again, letting go of her fear of isolation. And it's really sweet to see this young, bright kid get a new lease on life. Her story complements and mirrors the rest of the Dinazen on crew, and the series would be missing a certain spark without her. Chisei is voiced by Chika Anzai, who puts on a hilarious, at times sugar sweet performance, and always helps cue you into her state of mind. The final member of the Dinazen on crew, and the soul of the story itself, as well as being the team's initial leader, is the wild, free, and fascinating man known as Galma. Galma is a 5,000 year old warrior from ancient China and a kaiju user. A kaiju user being someone who can take control of kaiju. Think Khan Digifer and Alexis Carib. Galma has no clue as to how he exactly woke up in modern day Japan. All he can remember is that someone very important to him entrusted Dinazen onto him, and in that woman's honor he'll find pilots for the mech, and seek a new purpose in this modern world. But this turns out to be easier said than done, when it turns out that his old crew, the kaiju eugenicists, have also been reborn in modern day Japan, and are going on a spree of taking over and summoning kaiju. Galma vows to fight and defeat the eugenicists and take out any kaiju that they call upon, all while figuring out what exactly brought him to this modern day setting. And if you haven't figured it out already, the show itself makes this fact very apparent from the get-go, Galma is in fact the ancient Chinese mummy from episode 18 of Denko Chojin Gridman. The very same one Khan Digifer and Takeshi manipulated, and the one who initially died protecting the princess he once loved. This is a brilliant choice by Amamiya and Hasegawa. SSSS Dinazenon is built off a one-off episode of the original Tokusatsu, and somehow using that episode as its basis, becomes the best entry in the entire franchise. That is a feat in of itself, and retroactively makes an already great episode of the original show into possibly the best one. It only helps matters that Galma is an amazing character on top of that. Galma is the complete opposite of everything modern society expects from a person. He is completely buckwild, always operating off the handle with a manly bravado, and constantly words most of his statements in mantras, or phrasing that only he finds clever. He talks like a character from an old wuxia film, which makes sense as, again, he's an ancient Chinese warrior resurrected in modern day. Galma has trouble fitting into modern society, hilariously taking up a bunch of odd jobs and squatting under the nook of a bridge as his makeshift home. What carries him forward day to day is both training the Dinazen on crew, defeating the kaiju summoned by his former allies, and fulfilling the promise he made to the princess 5,000 years ago. But underneath his brash, charismatic presence is a man who knows he's living on borrowed time, time he isn't entirely positive how he obtained, all while building a team who can master the usage of Dinazenon. 
in hope that he can make his princess proud. His past from 5,000 years ago lingers over him like a specter, and the kaiju eugenicists and their destructive nature always stand as a stark reminder of who he used to be. He's afraid of wasting the miracle that is his newfound time on Earth, hoping to respect the princess's wishes and use Dina Zenon for nothing but good. And it's through Yomogi, Yume, Koyomi, and Chisei that he finds this opportunity, the four of them mirroring the four kaiju eugenicists who he betrayed thousands of years ago, almost seeing these four youths as a chance to do things over bringing them closer together and only serving as a positive influence. He even begins to see Yomogi as almost a disciple, the person who can take up his mantle after he's gone. He sees the Dina Zenon crew as a bright future, a future he may never get to see, but one that he knows that him and his princess can be proud of. One without kaiju roaming and destroying the world. Behind all of his endlessly entertaining, over-the-top behavior lies a heart of gold. Much like the other members of the Dina Zenon crew, it's a beautiful arc. It ties right into the show's central theme of never giving up and finding a way to move forward regardless of how rough the world can be. Becoming a hero is more about nurturing those around you, and learning to deal with our flawed existence as humans. No one in reality actually gets a second chance like Yauma, and the series uses its absurd fantasy elements to show him building a bridge for those who come after him. It's an extremely positive, outright humanitarian message, and I adore how the character of Gauma ties into it. He's voiced by Daiki Himano, who puts on a classically gruff, machismo-fueled performance, really leaning into Gauma's cheesier elements, while still selling his softer, more contemplative side. Outside of the Dina Zenon crew, the story's villains, the kaiju eugenicists, are a very interesting bunch, and they very much operate as a group unit, meaning that to talk about one of them, I have to talk about all of them. The kaiju eugenicists are Juga, voiced by Hiroshi Kamiya, Onija, voiced by Yuma Uchida, Mujina, voiced by Ayaka Sua, and Suzumu, voiced by Kochi Uchiyama. Each of the kaiju eugenists has their own very different view on life. Juga, who at first seems like the de facto leader of the group, is more interested in kaiju as beings themselves, and the potential fascinating science behind controlling them. In many ways, he still misses Gaoma's presence, reminiscing on the old days when they used to control kaiju together, offering up multiple olive branches to him. In fact, he even tries to recruit other members of the Dina Zenon crew as kaiju users. All of this leads to Juga representing the logic of the kaiju eugenists. He also ended up becoming the second most popular member of the kaiju eugenists because of his striking resemblance to singer Masayoshi Oishi, who ended up feeding into this in-joke himself. Contrasting Juga is Onija, who represents pure rage and murderous intent, finding blatant enjoyment in using his kaiju to kill people, always seeking the thrill, consequences be damned. The man enjoys killing, and he enjoys being angry. It's practically the only reason he still cares about kaiju control at all. Mujina, who ended up being the most popular member of the kaiju eugenicists, for not very surprising reasons, is a direct mirror to Koyomi, even getting directly involved with him, having a mutual respect for his lack of purpose, feeling a sort of kinship, as she's not sure of what to do with her life either. Though unlike Koyomi, who improves by way of those around him, and his own reflective look at himself, Mujina lacks the same source of direction, turning her into a thrill-seeker constantly searching for entertainment, and even bringing her personality closer to that of Onija's. Finally, the fourth and most interesting member of the kaiju eugenists, Suzumu is the seemingly soft-spoken, contemplative thinker of the group, who unlike Juga's more scientific, logical approach to kaiju, sees them as gods built from humanity's negative emotions, seeing them as man's platforms to vent and escape from all that pains them. Beautiful, immortal, perfect giants. Why suffer from the pain and mortality of human life? when a truly greater option in the form of kaiju is right there. It's this mentality that directly puts him at odds with Yomogi and Yume, as he can't fathom for the life of him why these two young, flawed, mortal beings would reject the chance to become hypothetical gods instead. Suzumu represents the antithesis of Dina Zenon's main message about moving forward and learning to appreciate the little things in life and our beautiful, limited time on this planet which essentially makes him the true antagonist of Dina Zenon, someone who doesn't understand the importance of human connection and joy at all. Dina Zenon's main cast is phenomenal. It's seriously up there as one of the best in recent years, completely avoiding SSSS Gridman's issue of the cast outside of Akane not really being given due time, with each character tying beautifully into the show's central message. But the cast and narrative of Dina Zenon are only half of what makes the show a masterpiece in my mind, because Dina Zenon is equally incredible on a visual and audio front. Dina Zenon is set in its own fictional district of Tokyo, Fujioki Dai, a district primarily based on the Katsushika Ward of Tokyo, with one of the series' most memorable pieces of iconography being located right along the Arakawa River. And by using more easily identifiable real-life locations such as this, Fujiokidai ends up feeling far less stapled together, and slightly less uncanny than Susujidai from SSSS Gridman. Though Fujiokidai doesn't lose all of its familiarity, many of the locations from SSSS Gridman are reused wholesale, with backgrounds being recreated in perfect one-to-one -one detail, and certain assets being fully reused. 
and this was a very intentional choice on Trigger's part. Beyond some thematic overlap, Dinozenon was always presented as a bit of a B-side to Gridman's A-side, and the reuse and remixing of locations from the first show helps emphasize this. Fujiyokidai is still somewhat familiar, but new, with a far more crowded, actively busy atmosphere that sits in harsh contrast with the almost vacant nature of Susujidai. On top of that, Dinozenon trades the late spring heat from Gridman for slightly cooler early fall weather patterns. Heavy rainfall, less hazy afternoons and mornings, sunset coming sooner than later, and characters dressed in layered clothing are just a few of the ways in which Dinozenon cues you into knowing that this is a different season. Again, we're seeing many familiar locations, but presented in a different time of year and a different atmosphere, which creates a unique sense of comfort and semi-nostalgia. Helping Fujiokidai further stand out is that damage done by the kaiju attacks actually remains as opposed to resetting, meaning that the layout and appearance of certain locations is permanently altered as the series moves forward, adding to the variety in locales. It also helps that while SSS as Gridman was a good-looking show, Dinozenon is a drop-dead gorgeous one. Nearly every single shot of Dinozenon is wallpaper-worthy, and I say this with no exaggeration. With improved storyboarding and cinematography all around, and even more focused blocking throughout all of its scenes, Dinozenon always keeps your eyes glued to the screen. Even in some of its moments of slightly more limited animation, the gorgeous environmental design and stunning lighting carries your investment forward, with the same expertly curated sound design of SSS's Gridman returning as well. Whether it be the quiet hum of fluorescent lights, the buzz of rain painting the pavement, or the footsteps and white noise of a shopping mall, Dinozenon's audio still brilliantly sells its atmosphere, with the same minimal usage of music outside of its fight scenes. Fight scenes that still carry the same explosive weight and booming impacts of its predecessor. Shiro Sagasu returns with a very different kind of soundtrack, complementing the more traditional orchestral and electronic pieces with twangy acoustics and heavy metal guitar riffs, communicating a very different energy in Dinazenon's fight scenes, with the series' central le motif being based around the song All This Time, a vocal track performed by Hazel Fernandez, the same vocalist who had worked with Shiro Sagasu before on the excellent Bleach insert song, Number One. OXT's Masayoshi Oishi returns with the series' phenomenal opening theme, the fittingly titled Imperfect, a track that seriously climbed up there as one of my favorite anime openings in recent memory, absolutely triumphant and proudly echoing the series' main message. The returning Maya Uchida's ending theme, Strobe Memory, serving as the perfect wind-down for the conclusion of each episode, accompanied by a very sweet ending montage of the Dinozenon crew just hanging out, being regular people. Also just like its predecessor, Masaru Sakamoto returns as the character designer, bringing that same soft, delicate touch to many of the younger characters, and going maximum trigger mode on Galma's design, perhaps the spikiest, most pointed character he's ever designed. Galma is such a trigger man in appearance that he almost puts other trigger men to shame. Characters still feature the same distinct eye patterns as they did in the first series, with the same level of care and detail being put into the subtle character animations. The animation team not having missed a step from SSSS Gridman. What was incredible there is still incredible here, with the moments of snappier, more intense animation flowing just as well as they did before. The animation highlight of the show being its incredible 10th episode, an episode overseen once again by Kai Ikarashi, who somehow managed to outdo his work on episode 9 of SSSS Gridman here, crafting what I think is one of my top three anime episodes of the last decade, a stunningly well-directed character study on all of the members of the Dinozenon crew. Dinozenon also carries forward the series' signature sense of awkward humor, with a new focus put into audio-based gags as well. Whether it be characters comically yelling over each other during a Gatai sequence, or Yume being unable to come up with a name for her attack. And that Shiro scene is legendary. It needs to be experienced to be believed. Dino Zenon also features just as many visual references to the original Tokusatsu as SSSS Gridman did, up to and including another cameo by Masaya Obi, who this time even gets to talk a little. Much of the same crew behind the excellent mechanical and kaiju designs of the first series also returns for Dinozenon, with Tsuyoshi Nonaka still being in charge of the mechanical design for the series, bringing with him one of the best designs of his career in the form of Dinozenon itself. Dinozenon is one of the thickest, chunkiest mechs in recent memory, with a wide, sturdy frame hearkening back to many of Nonaka's Transformers designs, as well as taking subtle elements of Thunder Gridman and King Gridman from the original Tokusatsu, complemented by a shining bright red color palette that's toyetic in all of the right ways. Each unit that makes up the combined Dinozenon looking distinct and logical in their own right, with the show's Gatai sequence being one of the most on-point recreations of a Brave series-like transformation scene in decades. The smaller combo forms made up of two pieces at once, such as Yomogi and Yume's combined form, the Soldier Wing, are also a great extension of the individual unit's designs, and of course, another brilliant way to sell some toys. Dinozenon's alternate combined form, Dino Rex, is also an incredible design in its own right, 
Being a giant mechanical Tyrannosaurus Rex with a bright red color palette, and a pair of draconic wings, this design harkens directly back to Dino Dragon from the original series, while somehow surpassing it in the cool factor. Dino Xenon and Dino Rex together make for what I consider to be some of the best super robot designs in recent years. An absolute knockout job on both fronts by Nonaka. There's also a third design in the show that I'm not particularly going to spoil, but let me just say it might be the gaudiest thing Nonaka has ever designed, and that is a compliment to its over-the-top nature. Matching Dino Xenon is the excellent kaiju design in the show, with many of the industry vets who worked on SSSS Gridman returning to provide new monsters for Dino Xenon to mash such as tokusatsu industry veterans Hideo Okamoto and Kiyotaka Taguchi, providing some kaiju of their own, the kaiju in Dino Xenon being bright, gaudy, and almost blinding in their color palettes, extremely oversaturated in a very appealing way. And while there was no Gridman to design this time around, Masayuki Goto still got to contribute to the show, this time in a kaiju he designed for the series, which I honestly have to say is one of the best designs of his entire career, and I do not want to dwell on this because it's worth seeing in motion and in the context of the story itself. But it is absolutely one of the best recent Tsuburaya Kaiju, period. Hiroki Mutaguchi returns once again to oversee the show's 2D action sequences, going even harder on the extreme, high-energy super robot battle sequences, with a particular focus on powerful impact frames and constant dynamic posing, with combat sequences being less derivative of the work of Masami Obari and more original and uniquely punchy in their own right. But the real star of the show again during the fight sequences is Grafinica's CG work. Bringing over the same high-quality model work they did in SSSS Gridman, this time with emphasis on thicker, more noticeable line work to make sure the models do an even better job matching their 2D counterparts, as well as the models' movements being overall smoother, more dynamic, and much faster in pace. This time not setting out to emulate the feeling of a tokusatsu battle, but instead to match the fast pace of the 2D sequences meaning that every battle in the show is a high-octane super robot spectacle, running laps around SSSS Gridman in dynamic storyboarding and speed, and upping the particle and visual effect count to highlight some seriously destructive mayhem. It's incredible stuff, and it means the already great CG got even better here. In my opinion, Dino Xenon is a certified masterpiece. With one of the best, most well-realized and fleshed-out cast of characters in recent memory, the same brilliant audio and visuals of the first show, but given an even stronger touch-up, one of the smoothest production schedules in the modern anime industry, the best super robot fights in years, and genuinely what I think is one of the most important morals and set of core values in any show from the last few decades. Dino Xenon isn't just the best entry in the Gridman franchise, but to me, the best anime Studio Trigger has ever produced, period. By a significant margin, in fact. There's a lot of anime that I truly love from the last decade, but very few shows were able to tick every single personal box of mine the way Dino Xenon was. Watching this show week to week as it came out, I was blown away on a consistent basis, and watching it again and again afterwards has only reaffirmed how strongly I feel about this show. I don't say this often, but I really believe this. Dino Xenon is a modern classic. It's the reason this entire video exists in the first place, and it managed to rekindle my already burning love of robot anime. It gave me hope for what the future of the genre may hold. Dino Xenon is a truly spectacular show, and one that I don't think we'll see anything similar to anytime soon. It's the perfect blend of old school and new school anime, and I'll cherish it forever. Dino Xenon was once again a success for both Trigger and Tsuburaya, matching SSSS Gridman in its TV ratings and receiving significant critical acclaim. And while its Blu-ray sales saw a 50% drop from SSSS Gridman's average, those are still above average sales figures for any show not called Umamusume. Though unfortunately outside of Japan, Dino Xenon was a bit of a dud, and part of this stemmed from Funimation's terrible handling of the international release, the show not being readily available on most anime streaming websites the way SSSS Gridman was and instead being exclusive to Funimation's website. And although their eventual Blu-ray release of the series was quite decent, while it was streaming the show had some very rough subtitles, outright mistranslating and getting information wrong, and unintentionally confusing audiences who would never watch the original Denko Chojin. It's a shame that the international release of the series was fumbled the way it was, because Dino Xenon really is an amazing show I believe way more people should watch. But it's not like the unfortunate reality of the series English release had any significant impact. Because back in Japan, Tsuburaya was once again very pleased with the work Amamiya and his team did, and would offer Studio Trigger one final collaboration to wrap up this would-be trilogy. And in late 2021, Gridman Cross Dino Xenon, the movie, was publicly announced, 
promising to be a crossover film between the two shows that served as a celebration and finale to Trigger's run on Gridman. Amomi would get his entire Dinazen on team to return once again, everyone from Hasegawa writing the script to Ikarashi getting to oversee certain animation sequences. And in late 2022, it would be announced that the movie was nearing completion, with its finalized title fittingly being Gridman Universe. Gridman Universe would release this previous late March 2023, getting a very limited but successful run in Japanese theaters. A run that I managed to catch two showings of, while I was in Japan this April. But with the movie currently going through a 4D run in Japanese theaters, and no digital release confirmed yet, with zero information on any international release of any sort, I've decided to keep this final segment of the video short, as Gridman Universe's core theme serves as an excellent closer to this lengthy retrospective. The basic setup of Gridman Universe's plot revolves around Utsumi and Rika drafting a stage play adaptation of the events of SSSS Gridman, their script constantly being belittled and rejected by many of their fellow students, with Utsumi and Rika having conflict over the direction the story should take. Rika believing that Akane's story should be the singular, central focus, with Utsumi believing that the tokusatsu action should take priority. Yuta would serve as a sort of mediator if he could, but his mind is set on something else, and that's asking Rika out. But before he can pop the question, a kaiju appears once again in Susujidai, wreaking havoc on the city, and with this kaiju attack returns Gridman and the support weapons, who reveal to the SSSS trio that reality is beginning to overlap and overwrite itself, with multiple universes beginning to compress in on themselves. If this potential calamity isn't stopped, it will cause a reverse Big Bang called the Big Crunch to occur, erasing everything. It's up to Yuta, Utsumi, Rika, and the Dinozenon crew who have arrived via universe convergence to assist Gridman in preventing this apocalyptic event. And that is the most basic summary of Gridman Universe. Because as was the case with SSSS Gridman and Dinozenon before it, Gridman Universe's overall basic setup is just its gateway into telling a far more nuanced tale. And to avoid getting into any further spoilers, as you know, the movie isn't even out digitally yet, and its only subtitled showing, having been a last-minute thrown-together event at Anime Expo 2023, I'm just going to loosely talk about what the central theme of Gridman Universe is, and why in many ways it's the perfect capstone for this franchise. But if you don't even want to hear that, you can skip to this timestamp. Gridman Universe instead takes a more meta approach revealing its main theme to be one about storytelling as a means of human expression, and the true purpose of superheroes like Gridman, the joy they bring, the people they inspire, and the countless interpretations and adaptations that can possibly result from all different walks of life. Gridman Universe builds off of Kazuo Tsuburaya's central philosophy when initially pitching the series. Gridman is the hero of dreams, and those dreams can belong to anyone. And Amamiya and Hasegawa brilliantly rounded out their trilogy by hearkening back to the franchise's conception like this. Gridman Universe is a legitimately great film. It also takes the time to clean up some of SSSS Gridman's errors, by significantly furthering the development of Yuta's character, and making him into a true hero in of himself. So even beyond its central themes and how those connect to the original tokusatsu, it's also just a great epilogue to the first anime, that also happens to feature the best fights by Grafinica yet. Seriously, these sequences need to be seen to be believed. Considering Gridman's newfound success, Universe surely won't be the final entry in the series. But when it comes to Akira Amamiya and Keiichi Hasegawa's story, Universe concludes that beautifully. There was also something about my second showing of Gridman Universe, the one I saw at Toho Cinema's Hibiya in Tokyo, that made me reflect on the franchise as a whole and why I love it so much. My theater was packed with everyone, from young adults, to middle-aged women, to children and young couples, and it made me think back to the core concept of the original tokusatsu that got this all started in the first place. Gridman is the hero of dreams, and by extension, Gridman is a hero for anyone. He's the perfect superhero for the modern digital age. Gridman is a series that fills me with a genuine sense of optimism that few other superhero stories or works of modern science fiction do. Beyond the amazing stunts, incredible battles, and ridiculous episode setups of the original Denko Chojin tokusatsu and the excellent 2D and CG fights of the Trigger shows is a story of everyday people, whether that be Naoto, Yuta, or Yomogi, and the growth they see as individuals channeled through the lens of the perfect digital superheroes for the modern age. Gridman as a franchise overall is one of the most positive and reassuring to ever come out of both the tokusatsu and anime industry, and I truly believe that in times as tough as these, that's something truly valuable. And even if it's unlikely any of them will hear this, I want to thank each and every person who's had a hand in this amazing series. And regardless of what Gridman's future holds, you know I'll be there to see it. Gridman truly is the hero of dreams.